Everybody's got one of these or a tablet, computer, or a uh, silence is that will make our meeting a little smoother. Uh, I want to introduce Jared, Jared McGraw. McCraw, excuse me, Jared, is, uh, is our uh, head of security for the school system. So Jared will be uh, the board representative out in the audience. So if anybody's got any questions or if we have any problems, uh, Jared will be willing to say hello. All right. Um, go through the official official piece here. Pursuant to the Board of Education Policy 1-13 public hearings, the board shall conduct public hearings as needed. The purpose of a public hearing is for the board to hear views expressed by citizens and gather information pertinent to issues or decisions that must be made or are under deliberation by the board. At the hearing, the board is not in session to answer questions, but is there solely to gather information and opinions. Comments made by board members must be in the nature of clarifying and informing. Pursuant to policy 1-13, I'm going to suggest some procedures for the hearing, as I did for our work session last Tuesday and the public hearing on Thursday. The purpose of this hearing is for the Board of Education to hear the public on the options being considered to address a crowd. Comments on matters unrelated to this topic will not be heard tonight, and the speaker will be placed on a list for public comment at an upcoming regular board meeting. This hearing will conclude at 10 p.m. As the public comments are enumerated in, in a Board of Education policy, 1-12, individuals may address the board for a maximum of three minutes. Any person who is representing a group may address the board for a maximum of five minutes. If the speaker purports to represent a group, they should be so authorized and they should be the only speaker allowed to represent that group. We have more than 50, we have more than 50 speakers signed up tonight. Uh, we will continue through the, the, the list ending at 10 p.m. Speakers will be called up in the order that they signed up through the communications department rotating through clusters. The chair will, oh, hold on one second before I have any motions. Um, folks, as we go through this so that, that we can get everybody through, um, if you'll hold applause and anything down, we'll, that'll be helpful. The other is, when we call the first speaker up, I'm going to have the next person who uh, is, is up at bat to uh, go ahead and come up and get positioned. There's some empty chairs up here, uh, so, uh, so please, uh, please do that. Um, other information is that at Stonebridge, there was a water line break. So I know you'll all be excited to know that the bathrooms are off limits until we get a call from the county to uh, let us know that we have water out here again. So we'll let you know that. Um, that being said, the chair will entertain a motion to accept these procedures. Is there any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? All right. That motion carries. So moving to item two, uh, indication is crowded. Grace of Cloud will be coming to your presence this evening, asking that you will help whatever decisions that you make. Grace of Cloud will be asking that you will lead and guide this board in the direction that you will have a decision. Grace of Cloud will be asking that you will lead and guide the community. Whatever we do, we will do it for the best interest of children and we will have a decision. Grace of Cloud will be asking to bless this board. Bless our food intended, bless our staff, bless all the teachers that work with the children in the Union County Public School. Grace Father, we ask 
Hi, my name is John Johnson. I reside at 8016 Avanti Drive um, in the Providence Glen subdivision in the village of Marvin. My phone number is 704-843-2373. My wife and I are the proud parents of two Marvin Ridge graduates and one Marvin Ridge rising sophomore. First, I want to thank you for all your service to our community and to our children. Um, it's not an easy job, and uh, I admire you for taking the time to do this. Um, but I stand with 97% of my neighborhood and thousands of parents across Western Union County who have opposed the redistricting plan from the beginning. As a parent, I am primarily concerned about some things that are kind of intangible, such as um, redistricting causing emotional stress to our adolescent children, um, the disruption of academic continuity and student participation in clubs and sports, uh, the way it divides communities and, and in some cases families and it also dampens school spirit and volunteerism. This decision seems to have been made kind of hastily without regard to a lot of the emotional and academic um, issues with our kids. Also the district's data was faulty. It did not take into account apparently the aging of students and thus overstated the impact of many established neighborhoods like ours. Providence Glen was said to have had 118 students, but after going door to door throughout the community, we found only 86 Martin Ridge Cluster students. This represents a 37% error. This plan is a temporary fix to a much larger crowding problem that is looming in the near future. There are enough new home permits to fill another high school and middle school in the next few years. In this county, runaway growth in one jurisdiction is allowed to adversely affect the school assignment of students in another jurisdiction. And I think that's unjust. Waxhaw has approved 5,000 permits. Um, Weddington, 829. Marvin, only 200. And another 5,000 in, in the unincorporated areas of the county. If I understand the numbers right, Parkwood, Cuthbertson, and the Weddington clusters will be growing at greater rates than Marvin Ridge. And yet, we in Marvin, in our corner, Marvin, are being asked to move to Weddington. It is clearly time to consider building a new high school and middle school cluster, perhaps around the Wesley Chapel area. After construction of new schools, I think we would all support a sensible redistricting plan. Until then, why can't we use a few learning cottages to manage the bubble? What about the $3 million offer? Marvin Ridge Middle School has only six learning cottages. Wingate Elementary currently has 20. 
I remember when uh, Wennington Middle had 50. That was chaos, I will admit. But we still have room, room to grow, and we have time to work this out. Back on. So, please pretend as needed. Uh, and if everybody will remember that uh, we've got the lights up there to give you the green light for the go, blink a little bit, move to a yellow, and then. Where's that at? Right in the center. Okay. Of the stage. Thank you. Okay. My name is Molly Gickling. I am here representing the Antioch Weddington Facebook group with over 600 members that it was just formed a few short weeks ago. We are here to let you know that we are against the redistricting plan. I also wanted to show you that our kids are not excited about this. They love their schools, and they don't want to leave them. So I don't know who I can hand this to, but I wanted you have a second tonight to take a look at those, and they all show why they don't want to leave their schools. But one of the main reasons we are not sold on the redistricting plan is it doesn't solve the overcrowding issue. It just moves it. It moves the overcrowding from newer schools to older schools that are not equipped to handle it. Furthermore, it doesn't just relieve the overcrowding at the newer schools, it puts many of these schools under capacity for the next five years. This plan was to relieve overcrowding and utilize empty seats. But it does neither of these things well. But it does shuffle 5,800 students around and disturb the learning environment for 38,000 of the 42,000 plus students in our school system. The legitimacy of the redistricting plan is based on capacity levels and their corresponding cap levels. Dr. Webb has explained to me that schools are capped when a school is 200 students over capacity. What bothers us about this cap method is it's a one-size-fits-all approach. It is not proportional to the school's capacity, nor does it take into account the school's facility condition, size, and adherence to NCDPI state guidelines. Let's talk about the two recently capped middle schools, Marvin Ridge and Porter Ridge. These schools have a capacity of 1,200 students, so their cap level is 1,400. Their cap level is 117% of capacity. Compare this to New Salem Elementary School, which has a capacity of 289 students. So it caps out at 489 students. That cap is equal to 170% of capacity. 170% compared to the middle school's 117% of capacity. That's a big difference. Let's go back to the capped middle schools, Marvin Ridge and Porter Ridge Middle. They were built in 2005 and 2006 and were built with large core capacity areas. In fact, some of these areas can easily hold 400 students over capacity and still meet the state guidelines. Per Dr. Webb, newer schools like these have a higher core capacity because they have more square footage in the building and support spaces and are built to hold more students. Yet, the redistricting doesn't just relieve Marvin Ridge, it puts the school below capacity levels and completely underutilizes it for the next five years. Let's compare this to Sun Valley High, the school that will be the most overcrowded after the redistricting. It was built in 1960. It was built with small core capacity areas. Most of these areas don't come close to meeting state guidelines. Facility committee notes state that extensive core capacity renovations need to be done in order to meet the guidelines. However, this school will be filled to cap levels, and the cap still follows that same 200 students above capacity. This, to me, shows a total disregard for state space guidelines and its students. The school should undergo its seven plus million dollars of renovation before it is filled up to cap levels. That brings me to another subject. Why are all the schools that are so desperately in need of repairs the ones that the redistricting plan fills up? If a school is in need of more than $1 million worth of repairs, you can almost guarantee that this school will increase in capacity. If a school is new and does not need repairs, you can almost guarantee that it will decrease in capacity after the redistricting. So why is there such a strong correlation? Are you trying to make a point to the VOCC? Are you trying to just open up the newer schools for developers? Or do you just want to create a construction havoc? Finally, how is it that the capacity of 24 of the Union County schools have changed since 2009? Some of them have increased, 
and some of them have decreased. Dr. Webb has told me that they are based on new studies, and these new studies warrant bel use building space and not site use. We have yet to see these reports, and we would like to see these reports to see how the new capacities were calculated. All we have to look at are the facility committee notes, and they make it tell a little bit different story. The facility committee notes state that some of the capacities changed were based on principal classroom audits. Those audits were formulated by the number of students per classroom, number of times per day a classroom is used, and the type of classes that are held in these rooms. Dr. Webb, this sounds more site-based than building-based to us. So again, if we could just see these capacity reports, because if the capacities are totally inaccurate, then we are even more in more trouble than I originally thought. Cap levels are based on capacity levels, so if the capacity numbers used in the redistricting report are not accurate, then we have, again, more problems than I've already discussed. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Catherine Stout from Indian Trail. I represent Sun Valley. We've heard a number of valid arguments against redistricting, and I used those arguments when I fought redistricting twice. But I tend to believe that the first reaction to anything belies how you really feel, and the first reaction we heard in all of this is, my child is not going to that school. I would like to address the misconceptions about that school, in this case, Sun Valley Middle and High. We do have older buildings and outdated athletic facilities, but remember, when UCPS was building your fabulous new school campuses, our school was being neglected. And our school has lower, schools, lower scores than those of your wealthier, more homogenous schools. Our school has some kids who make bad choices and don't always represent the school the way we would like, but then so does yours. Sun Valley is diverse, racially, culturally, economically, professionally, and educationally. We have kids who struggle, but we also have lots of high flyers. And the idea that the education offered at our school is vastly inferior, as one parent stated in the newspaper, and that your child's future would be put at risk by attending Sun Valley schools is nonsense. My son has been accepted at four major universities, two with scholarship offers. He'll be attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill along with several of his friends at Sun Valley. We boast graduates attending major universities all over the Southeast along with Stanford, Cornell, and the Air Force Academy, to name a few. We have a strong athletic tradition, winning multiple conference championships in multiple sports, and we have many kids playing at the college level. We have an award-winning student council that raises annually over $20,000 to provide Christmas to 40 families in Union County. Our award-winning ROTC will represent our school in Hawaii this year at the Pearl Harbor Parade. Our honor choir will perform at Carnegie Hall, and our band will march at the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City this spring. We have excellent drama and FFA programs, and one of the few remaining school newspapers around. Our middle school won five athletic championships last year. It's an international global school, and it met 100% of its growth goals for the EOCs. Both of our schools have highly qualified teachers, staff, and dynamic new principals. And we have families that care about the schools and work hard to do the best with what we have. Nobody likes redistricting, but you must not lose sight of the needs of the other students in the county while trying to please this segment of the population. Union County Public Schools has spent hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 15 years building fabulous new schools while neglecting the older schools in the county, and we're suffering the consequences of that neglect now. Spending tax dollars to build new schools, to add additional space, or to add modular, modular units will divert tax dollars that should now be spent on the older schools. Shame on you all if you spend one more dollar on the newer schools before addressing the urgent needs and even some of the, um, some of the wants of the older schools, especially when there is space in the, uh, in the schools to accommodate everyone. Not another dollar should be allocated to make these children more comfortable before the children in the older communities are afforded the same privilege. Thank you. Dr. Doc, no oh gosh. Dr. Ellis, as you were once an English teacher, I believe you will appreciate the following quote by the great Atticus Finch from *To Kill a Mockingbird*. 
Children are children, but they can spot an evasion quicker than adults, and evasion simply muddles them. Good evening, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Webb, Board of Education members, and parents and children here tonight, and those watching via live stream. My name is Kaylee, and I'm representing the students of the Potter's Trace subdivision. And I'm here to tell you that I am more than a test score or vacancy to be filled. Let me repeat, I am more than a test score or vacancy to be filled. For me, this is about loyalty, commitment, truth and integrity, friendships, being a Wildcat, and graduating a warrior. Like many of my friends, I'm an active participant in my education. I've been in AIG and will enter high school with two credits from Honors English 9 and Math 1. I will also be representing Weddington Middle School at the MPA on March 12th by playing first chair clarinet. I don't believe I'd be at this level if it wasn't for the loyalty and commitment from my teachers. Did you hear me? Loyalty and commitment. From Battle of the Books to the school play and the cross country team, I've enjoyed these extracurricular activities, something that will be lost for so many students and parents if they are moved to a different school. Unfortunately, even at the age of 13, I'm not witnessing loyalty and commitment from those who oversee our schools. Yes, my parents moved here from another state. Yes, my parents researched the schools before purchasing the biggest investment of their lives. Yes, my parents, along with all the parents in this room and those watching the live stream, believe in neighborhood schools. Let me remind you that this is listed fourth on your school redistricting policies. No, my parents, along with the majority of those in this audience and those at home watching the live stream, do not believe redistricting is the answer. Do what's right and vote no for redistricting. I wonder if you realize the dinner conversations going on. Parents are struggling for words to come out. Their dreams, my hopes, are being squashed by many, not all, board members. Dr. Ellis and Dr. Webb, how do you sleep well at night knowing you're basically telling us to get over it and put on a new uniform? My brothers are 8 and 10. Do you want to come to our house and tell my younger brothers to get over it and put on a new uniform? I didn't think so. Although Mr. Yurchek has stated time and time again that the Board of Education has the duty to oversee 42,000 students and over 200,000 taxpayers, this board is only allowing 100 to speak out. I am one of the lucky ones. Although we don't have a final tally yet, I believe Thursday was 50 against, 0 for redistricting, it is clear that the majority of your stakeholders are opposed to redistricting. You, the Union County Board of Education, have the choice to do what's right and vote no for redistricting. Show true, show true leadership and be loyal to us, as we've been to you in our schools. We're losing faith in you, and at 13, that's difficult to digest. You have viable options. Keep us in our home schools. Allow the new developments to attend the schools you are proposing us to move to. This will create a loyal base for them as well. Take the $3 million you said you needed for the mobile classrooms in order to stop the redistricting. Let me remind you. You said, we can do it, when you showed your PowerPoint on options to stop redistricting. Your PowerPoint read, do not cap or reassign, but you needed $3 million for 49 mobile classrooms. Now you have the $3 million. Stop making excuses and accept the money to end this once and for all. Hundreds of parents and students put countless hours into researching alternatives in order to help you. No board member had anything to do with this plan. In case these were lost in your emails, here's the hard copy. Many of these school reconfiguration alternatives are already successfully used throughout the United States. Such a plan will keep our children in their current school clusters. And according to, and according to a study by Duke University, leaving sixth graders in their current school in elementary schools is beneficial academically and socially. On the other hand, it states, the effects of having sixth graders in middle schools include a decline in motivation and a loss of self-esteem, decline in academic achievement, strains on interpersonal functioning, and increased risk of dropping out of school. I imagine you would expect research from such a prestigious North Carolina university. A copy of the study has also been provided for you. I understand you are in a very difficult position right now and that many of you have been vocal about not running again, maybe because you can't handle the stress of this. Imagine me, along with thousands of other students who are stressed over this but are not able to say, we quit, we're walking away. We don't have that choice. I'd like to finish by telling you why I'm holding this American flag. My older brother, Blaine, graduated from Weddington High School and enlisted in the United States Marines. While serving his country in Afghanistan last year, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, he brought home this flag which flew over Camp Leatherneck. I tell you that... Roberts, 
Good evening, the Board of Education. Angela Evans is my name. Providence Glen, the neighborhood I claim. North Carolina, Union County, and Marvin taxes I pay. Staying in Marvin Cluster Schools is my goal at the end of the day. Please know we are an engaged but distrustful voting base. Board members call us names, and still we stand to state our case. Board members disrespect each other, yet demand and dictate how we act. The lack of transparency and hidden agendas forces us to be on the attack. Regardless of how we feel, our mission will continue to promote, to get the board to stop, slow down, consider all the options before you vote. Three minutes? I could take three hours and not be done. So here are a few words from my daughter and my son. My daughter was straight to the point, distraught and trying not to shout. If I don't go to Marvin, I'm alone, no friends starting over, I'm afraid and stressed out. My son wanted to be here, but said, Mom, I know you got this. So a couple of thoughts from him about what he calls that ratchet mess. Denver, Colorado, my home until 2009. Started sixth grade in Charlotte, day one and on time. I've worked hard to ban student council, learning how the school runs. I know teachers, staff, friends, and plan coursework for college when I'm done. And now you tell me to start over, move schools? Yeah, won't that be fun? And I worry about my sister, who might be traveling the opposite direction from me. How can our family support us and the schools going back and forth from A to B? Shh. Are you listening to the message we're trying to send? If not, please fess up. Are we just spitting in the wind? You've heard facts and figures, so those I won't repeat. And you've received no mixed messages from those allowed to speak. Superintendent Ellison Webb, you're not particularly off the hook. You've presented viable options, but were they really part of the possible playbook? Our requests are not unwieldy or completely out the box. Slow down. What's the rush? Operate in truth, not fly like the fox. The committees, neighborhoods, parents, and children are united, I'm sure you can see. This is the reason I fight. We fight because the children deserve the best we can be. Is this really about overcrowding? Maybe that's all a smoke and mirrors act. Inequities, money, power, control, we certainly don't have all the facts. These plans need to address all the challenges stretching from east to west. All the county's children deserve our very best. Redistricting is a short-term fix for a county which continues to change. What we need is a plan with a view and long-term range. These decisions affect students, families, volunteers, staff, and the like. We need clear intent. Cooperation, collaboration, enough with the stress and strife. If your focus is truly on student success, you will take your time and you will do what's right. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board. When you look upon the redistricting proposal from, a, from an outsider's perspective, this is truly boils down to a change management process. I'm Bob Loker. I'm, I'm from Callenwood Estates in the Weddington Cluster. So what is change management? According to Wikipedia, it's an approach to transitioning individuals, teams, and organizations to a desired future state. It's hugely critical that this board you know, have a solid change management plan as part of any change but especially when it when one involves the moving of some 6,000 students. Why is change management so, so essential? Because change needs to be understood and managed in a way that people can cope effectively with it. Change can be unsettling, so the leadership, the board, logically needs to be the, the settling influence. So now how have we done up to this point? You know, we've, we've all heard about the crisis and, you know, talked about all these issues that we're facing. We've read the report. And this is what we've heard, okay? We've heard about the overcrowding. We've heard about that next year, without redistricting, there's going to be three high schools that are 95-plus percent to capacity. But yet, with the redistricting, we still have three high schools at 95%-plus to capacity. That is not solving. That's shifting. I also hear about you know, the redistricting will not incur additional operating costs. How the heck are we going to do buses, more buses, and not incur cost? How are we going to incur, we're going to be loading enrollment, 14.4% 14 
in the additional enrollment, up to 35% additional enrollment in this particular school in one academic year in the three high schools. And we're not going to incur additional operating costs. These three schools that we're talking about were built in 1961 and prior. I, I've, been, I've been alive since 63, and I'm breaking down. <laughs> We've also noticed inconsistencies with the plan. You know, we see several communities, some of them which are very affluent, who have been mysteriously omitted from this plan, even though geographically they're closer to the new clusters. We've seen that these cap levels that are reported through facilities management report as well as by McKidman report are different. Something's not driving up for us. You guys are not idiots. Okay, you truly are not idiots. We know that. But what we're at, we're just not understanding the infatuation with this redistricting. Okay? I've seen some incredible work being done by the citizens. You know, the young lady who spoke, remarkable. The, the work that's come out has been remarkable. I ask that you trust us and that you, that you use us as a partner and not as a roadblock. You know, be transparent with us and as such, trust us to understand what your goals and motives are. You know, I'm presuming the quality and equity... Thank you. Okay. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brenda Jacobson and I have been a Union County resident for over 16 years. My son is a very, very proud Sun Valley Spartan and I wouldn't change about a thing about being a Sun Valley Spartan mom. I know I'm in the minority here tonight, but here are my thoughts. My thoughts are those that are shared by many parents and students in the Sun Valley Cluster. I am 100% against you authorizing any money for new mobile classrooms. Overcrowding is not good. Eating lunch at 10 a.m. and 1.30 is not good. And spending five hours in a trailer is not good. I've experienced that in the past with my children. With redistricting, we are filling empty seats and eliminating these conditions. I'm not a psychic, but I predict the same group of parents that are here tonight and we're there Thursday night, we'll be back here in a couple of years asking you to build additions to their schools. And I just don't want my tax dollars to go there. Um, lo uh, mobile classrooms are not a long-term solution, and we just need to move kids to where there is space. I've heard parents say that their students won't be able to participate in extracurricular activities or that they'll be on the buses before 6 a.m. until after 5 p.m. I don't think that is true. Most of the proposed schools are just a little bit further than where they are right now and the trip won't take more than 20 minutes. We aren't moving our kids across the country. Looking back at my son's education and time at Union County Public Schools, if I could do it over again, I would have gotten involved much earlier and made sure to keep the older schools and the students from being forgotten and overlooked time and time again. If we, don't, if we didn't build these extravagant schools and instead built conservatively and allowed some of the money to be spent on the, young, uh, the older schools, we wouldn't be dividing the county so much. Shame on you, Union County Public Schools and the Board of Education for ignoring the older schools for so long. But I forgot you've had your hands full with these parents. <laughs> enough is enough. In closing, I've been offended by many of the comments I've read and heard from Union County parents. And contrary to what you've heard, Sun Valley has some great things going on. Life is full of change and change isn't always easy to accept. And um, it's time to embrace change. Good things come from change. Kids can adapt and parents can be a positive uh, influence on their children. We are Spartan proud. Thank you. My name is Lars Knapp. 
I'm here representing the Hunters Point community, and as such, I have five minutes to speak. I'm going to use a portion of that time to allow this young lady to finish her speech. I have one really quick last line for my speech. I just want to say that if you vote yes for redistricting, you are taking away our hopes, dreams, and freedoms. And remember, Dr. Ellis, it is a sin to kill a mockingbird. Thank you. I love that Weddington pride. I'm not here to speak about how redistricting will impact me personally. In fact, as a high school senior, redistricting will have no impact on what school I will attend next year. However, it will change the lives of my friends, the children I tutor, and countless other people that I have never met and will never meet. I am here as a student to tell you that students are not numbers on a spreadsheet. We are humans, and we would like to remind the board that these schools are like our second homes. As humans, we have this innate drive within ourselves that makes us gravitate toward what we hold dear. Among these are our family and our homes. We find ourselves in a bind whenever one of these is disturbed, and passion and anger will drive us to fight. This board and this school system have now experienced the passion and the anger firsthand. However, the board did not learn from this experience. Instead, you, the Board of Education, have descended into a state that has made a mockery out of Union County and brought unprecedented shame to its citizens. Men and women alike will not be open to change especially when an outside force uses its power to impact their families or their homes. Love thy neighbor finds its textual roots in the writings of the Old Testament. But this has been human nature from the beginnings of time. This eternal affection with this neighbor will be forever ingrained in our lives because our neighbors make up our community. As this board has made its attempts to ruin the homeostasis of community that so many of us enjoy, we have fought back. And in this fight, we have found that there are many plans, some that have been made readily available to you that would allow for the continuity of our community. The board should remember that the staff of the school system, the parents and students of all ages, will be happy to comply with the Board of Education should it mean that we are able to stay in our clusters. The people of this district have worked hard to be where we are today. Whether that be a parent who worked 80 hours a week to afford a house in the best school system in the state of North Carolina, whether that be the student like myself who has spent many sleepless nights working on assignments to prepare themselves for the next day, or to prepare the club which they are the president of for a successful future, whether that be the athlete who has shed blood, sweat, and tears to make his team the best that it could be, or whether that be the teacher who poured their heart and souls into the students that sit before them, we have all worked to be where we are today, and we all deserve the right to observe the development of ourselves and those who stand around us, right up until the day that we will, as a community, walk across the stage to accept our diplomas, the day that we will, as a community, weep tears of joy to mark the transition from childhood to adulthood, until we, as a family, graduate from our school. The small child in elementary school, the eighth grader in middle school, and the high school senior all look forward to the day that we can stand together and observe this accomplishment and can graduate knowing that the village that raised us will forever be a part of who we are. For someone to come and disrupt in one motion the very foundation that have made these communities what they are would be unacceptable. I stand before the Board of Education, the superintendent of this school system, and ask that redistricting be taken off the table as a solution to overcrowding at least until all other options have been exhausted and more time, more time has been given to each of the alternatives that were presented by Dr. Ellis than was used to create the redistricting plan that is in all truth an outrage to the hardworking citizens of this county. Thank you. My name is Susan Evans. I come here tonight as a parent, as a nationally certified educator. I taught for 15 years and I went through three major redistricts in, in Charlotte-Mecklenburg. I've seen firsthand what it does to students, teachers, and families, and it is always difficult. I want to share advice that I used to give my children in the classroom and relate it to this redistricting. Examination periods are long for a reason. Use this time to check the easy answers as well as the difficult ones to make sure that mistakes were not made. 
Hurrying through this test could mean the difference between an A and any other letter. Why are we hurrying such an excellent school district through this test? Have we missed seeing that moving our neighborhoods will cause Sun Valley Middle to be overcrowded the very year those students get there? That within two years, Sun Valley High School will be on the watch list at 15% over capacity? That Weddington High School would take four years to get to that level of crowding with the students enrolled now? How is this new overcrowding the right answer? Consider all of your options. If you think that you may be making a mistake, reconsider and don't be afraid to stop. If you decide that it was indeed a good decision, you can always continue. Consider more options such as multi-tracking the overcrowded middle schools while in the population bubble, building additions, reconfiguring some elementary schools or offering magnet choice programs. The worst case scenario of stopping is that we have to continue this discussion next year. The best case scenario is long-term stability for our students. We can do this. And this is better. Have school spirit and get involved. My nine-year-old is a proud Antioch Gator. I have a rising kindergartner who would also like to be a Gator. Instead, Sandy Ridge is moving kids to Weddington. Weddington kids move to Antioch, and Antioch kids move to Indian Trail. These are all fine schools. But who wants to leave their own school? Parents make a village for their children when they are young. We build that village, and we help each other out. We have community with these parents. This is ripping apart our communities, and it is very, very painful for us. These schools have our blood, sweat, and tears. Antioch will have fewer students next year than it has this year if redistricted. In fact, current Antioch lines are in a pocket where elementary growth is expected to decline in the next few years. Why can my youngest not be a Gator? To make room for children whose parents haven't even moved them here yet? Isn't that the problem in Marvin, which is moving Sandy Ridge and eventually causing us to be bumped? I ask you, is school choice only available for newcomers? Lastly, I used to tell my students, always do your best work. We are in a place now where we have to ask ourselves some difficult questions. The question I have right now is, do we want to be right or do we want to do what is right? You will get to vote and you will get to make a decision that affects many, many lives. Slow down. Keep asking the questions. Keep rechecking the numbers and asking for our help and input. Redistrict is an option, but it is not the only option. We want our students to be innovators and lifelong learners. Let's show them that by our examples as parents and board members. You have our attention. And together, we can come up with a plan for our schools and students that will provide long-term solutions. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Peter Friedrich. I'm a resident and small business owner in the community of Wesley Chapel in the Weddington area. I'm against redistricting and busing. I have faith, trust, and confidence are the core values that have kept myself, my family, living, working, and supporting these communities and schools. The purpose of my speech this evening is to ensure that you, the Board of Education, understand clearly, clearly that redistricting is not in line with the core values of this community or its schools. My statements tonight will ask each of you to visit your recommendations of redistricting and ensure it meets these com communities' core values. One, faith. Does your voting base have faith in you and your decision of redistricting? Two, trust. Does your voting base have the trust in you that this is the best plan and that no other factors of politics are involved? Is busing just about education of our children or are there other motivations? Confidence. Does your voting base have confidence busing is the answer? As a community member, I've lost much faith in the Union County Board of Education. The board has acted without transparency and continues to act in disregard. The Board of Education has tried to scare our communities into thinking our schools are unsafe. The Board fostered cap numbers that are subjective and not fact-based. The Board of Education has said that the education our children will receive will be less than the standard that has been set in schools based on the size and are not if the size is not controlled. The community knows better and knows that busing is not the answer. Changing the name of busing to redistricting will not, will not work. The history of Union County schools and the many other schools clearly show that community schools work and they work well. As an example, Wesley Chapel and Weddington schools have dealt with mobile classrooms in the past and the bubble in the past. Through the bubble and, and the mobile trailers, 
The school districts have grown both academically and as a community from this experience. We as a community voted you to your position that you hold today and showed our willingness to trust you. We want to trust you. When voting, the community understood the Board of Education liked, wanted, and would promote community schools and build on the model that's in place today and is working very well. The Board of Education adopted a saying from prior superintendent that the board holds in high regards that says, prepare all students to succeed. The same gentleman, Ed Davis, also said, it takes community and parents to prepare all students to succeed. Success would not be possible without the cooperation and contributions of our community and parents. These small, these small quotes gave us trust that the Board of Education valued community as much as the community for which you serve. Build, build trust, don't bust our kids outside the communities we choose to live in and go to school in. The option of resolution outlined by in a prior meeting presented by Mary Ellis did not bring any confidence. Thank you, Mr. Good evening, Chairman Yurchek, board members, Dr. Ellis, and school administration. As with many other neighborhoods, you have received a packet from Valhalla Farms containing information supporting our desire to remain in the Marvin Ridge cluster. Dr. Ellis recently referred to Valhalla in a brief comment on low density, low impact neighborhoods, otherwise known as onesie twosies. Valhalla Farms is a prime example of that onesie twosie neighborhood and here is why. We are and have historically been since the 1970s a low impact, low density neighborhood. In fact, we would be considered one of the neighborhoods that is aging out according to many reports. Our 13 students that would be redistricted, redistricted currently attend the Marvin Ridge Cluster schools that are located one mile from Valhalla Farms. Being just a mile from the Marvin Ridge schools, we see the sky lit up on Friday nights uh, from the stadium lights and hear the band playing during the football games. We would ask that our 13 students impacted by redistricting would remain in the Marvin Ridge cluster schools that they have attended since the schools were opened. These 13 students include four elementary, three middle high, and six high school age students. If redistricted, Valhalla's four elementary students will travel five times farther to Newtown Elementary than the current one mile to Sandy Ridge. If the two fifth graders are grandfathered, that bus would be transporting only two elementary students from Valhalla to Newtown six miles away. <clears throat> In addition, one of our families would potentially have four children assigned to four different schools across two clusters. Given the concern of student transportation costs, the greatest efficiency is achieved with our current bus route. We have for years shared this route with a neighborhood across Waxhaw Marvin Road, which will remain in the Marvin Ridge Cluster. Valhalla Farms recognizes there, there are tough choices that the board will have to make. Considering the unique nature of Valhalla Farms, being that Wednesday Tuesday neighborhood, we ask that you reconsider current redistricting proposal and allow our 13 students to remain in the Marvin Ridge Cluster. We thank you for your consideration of our request and for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Doug Neesmith, and I'm speaking to you in favor of the redistricting proposal, so I guess I'm in the minority, um, for our county students. Let me begin by saying, you have a very unenviable task before you. It is a situation where no matter what is decided, students' lives will be impacted and people will be upset. There is no perfect solution where everyone can be 100% satisfied, but we trust you will make or take all of the facts into account when making your decision in the upcoming months. As a parent, I understand the emotional and impassioned pleas from so many regarding their current child school assignment. I know that love for a child and their well-being can be a very strong motivator. It is very difficult to see the big picture sometimes when so focused on a specific situation. 
As a 20-year veteran teacher here at Parkwood Middle and High School, let me assure anyone who is concerned that our teachers care about every student we encounter each day. We strive to help each child reach their full potential and challenge them to reach for bigger and better. Yes, our school buildings are older. That, however, does not have any bearing on the work produced by our teachers and students. If we allow the physical building to dictate results, we are focusing on the wrong things. The Parkwood students and faculty are a very supportive and caring group. I have heard parents talk of their current assigned schools with words like family and culture. I can assure you that the Parkwood schools have that same family feeling as other schools. We rally around our students and families whenever a need arises and we help each other out. We support our academics and athletics with zeal and enthusiasm. My understanding of redistricting is this. When the student population becomes unbalanced in the schools, the school system has to react by relocating students. This is a reaction to something outside the school system's control. There are reports that estimate growth, but it is just that, an estimate. No one has a crystal ball to know what will actually happen. There have been many fingers pointed at different groups why this has occurred, and the school system has been receiving most of those accusations. But since when does the school system control building permits and neighborhood development? Is there room for improved communications between those groups? Sure, but playing the blame game now won't fix the current situation you're facing. There have been many alternatives given to the proposed plan, some more financially viable than others. If there were an endless supply of resources, everyone would be happy, but that is not the reality. The facts are that we are overcrowded at some schools while being under capacity at others. Logically, it makes the most sense to take advantage of the available space we have, with the understanding that we are limited on the number of students we can have in a building of a certain size. Is there any real choice? You are tasked with taking all of the facts presented to you by Dr. Ellis and her staff, listening to the comments from the parents, and coming up with the best solution. It is a very difficult situation, one that will have lasting consequences. I would simply ask that all of the facts be considered, political motives be put aside, and that you vote for what will benefit all of the children in the Union County school system. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christy Fletcher and I am speaking for the Chestnut Oak Subdivision. We have looked at the data communicated by the Board of Education. We raised numerous questions regarding the data and to date there has been no response from the Board of Education. Some of the questions we have asked are, why have the capacity numbers changed before redistricting and after? Why are the older schools immediately coming up to the watch level and the newer ones are not? Why does the cluster data five-year projection after redistricting show that Cuthbertson High School will remain underutilized for the next five years, while Sun Valley High will be over capacity in one year and remain on the watch list for the next five years? We are asking for the Board of Education to communicate with us and help us understand how this massive redistricting effort is good for our students and beneficial to the school system. As parents, we ask valid questions concerning the data and have yet to receive answers. We have shown that bus ride times, miles traveled, and costs will likely increase. This massive move of students will impact those that are moved, and those that remain in place will be impacted too. The students who are not moved will lose relationships built over years. Imagine the rising juniors that have been in the same cluster since kindergarten. Relationships that have been built over an 11-year period will be torn apart. Ever since the proposal to redistrict, the parents have attempted to become part of the conversation. So far, it seems that only the VOCC has heard us. Yes, saying that is sure to ruffle feathers. However, it would seem that the commissioners are beginning to see a bigger picture for not only our students, but also for all the citizens of Union County. The commissioners became aware that one of the options to halt a massive redistricting was the use of MCRs. They even knew the cost of this option. Somebody communicated this information to the commissioners, and prior to the February 18th BOE work session, it seemed as though there was failure to communicate from both. We communicated to the BOE that we agree that MCRs are not the long-term solution, yet the short-term use of mobile classrooms allows the county time to evaluate all options, devise a long-term plan for the population changes in Union County, and proceed in a more palatable fashion without a massive redistricting. I ask you to consider the following selected points from the Board of Education Policy Manual, Section 4-13. Maximize benefits to students. Number four, adhere to neighborhood schools concept. Five, limit the number of transitions for same students. 
Six, minimize the negative social-emotional impact on students from being separated from classmates. Seven, utilize long-term planning. Eight, minimize transportation cost and ride times. Nine, communicate to public. Thirteen, maximize quality of life stability. Fourteen, maximize community school relationships. We believe that the current plan put forward by the Board of Education honors none of these guidelines. Friday, I attended the Board of Education Strategic Planning Committee meeting and observed an exchange between a parent and BOE member. I overheard the parent asking for a town hall meeting form in which questions could be asked and answered, as there seemed to be no answers from the BOE. You probably saw that on the news, so we'll just skip on. Chestnut Oak stakeholders asked the BOE to accept the $3 million from the commissioners, purchase MCRs, and use them, giving time to adequately plan for the long term. We want the BOE to know that our cluster is a community. We moved here to attend the Antioch Weddington cluster, and we have spent many hours volunteering and supporting Antioch Weddington. We asked the Union County Board of Education to slow down and formulate better alternatives to work through population bubbles in the affected clusters. We ask that you build a more collaborative environment, utilizing the incredible strength of the talented residents of Union County to arrive at a more reasoned and planned response to the problems we face. The past eight weeks have definitely been an educational experience. The redistricting has caused me to research and review what the BOE policy and core values are. I am thankful that as a citizen I have the obligation and right to vote. I am also grateful to be shaken out of my apathy and to be asked, where have I been? For this is a great question, and come November, I will communicate my answer. As I suspect with a greater portion of Union County residents, I will close with this quote from our 40th president. Every once in a while, somebody has to get the bureaucracy by the neck and shake it loose and say, stop what you're doing. Good evening. My name is Dan Nichols, and I represent the, and live in the Marvin Cluster. Uh, first, I'm here tonight to tell you that I don't envy the dilemma that you all face. Frankly, I'm not sure I've ever witnessed so much opposition to a proposal in my life. And I'm sure the evolution of social media probably has a lot to do with that. But that alone should be an eye-opener to this board. If a plan causes this much opposition, maybe it should be reconsidered. I think it's safe to say that you've clearly heard from a significant number of people who oppose the redistricting plan. And I know you've heard rebuttals to every data point and every statistic, so I'm not going to get into a bunch of numbers or talk about the finer points of core capacity or the ability to shelter in place, but I'm going to make three quick points about the overall plan. First, we don't have a safety issue, at least when it comes to the census numbers. I spent over 25 years protecting the safety and health of people and managing facilities for a living. I'm, I do have some qualification to say that the minor differences in before and after redistricting censuses at these schools does not provide a statistically significant increase or decrease to the safety of the students regardless of brick and mortar or mobile classrooms. Further, the Union County Fire Marshal also does not have a concern. When contacted, he indicated that the number of students in these schools did not even come close to presenting a legitimate safety concern. However, I will caution you on this one. A number of folks have already raised a legitimate safety concern based on the time proven statistic that the increase in the number of miles driven by buses, parents, and teenage students as a result of this proposed plan does raise a valid concern of a likely increase in vehicle accidents and possible injuries or worse that you all should weigh very heavily. Second, what we do have is an inconvenience issue. Sure, the hallways may get a little crowded and the lunch line can get a little long and this might be an inconvenience, but I'm not really sure you should be suddenly redistricting 5,800 kids because of what could be considered an inconvenience. Besides, if a parent is concerned about a ch their child attending an, a capped or slightly overcrowded school, they can actually reassign themselves. That's right. There's already a provision allowing for a parent to request a transfer to any school with less than 110% capacity. However, I would be very surprised if more than a handful of people would actually do this. Third and lastly, what we really have here is an opportunity. This board has an unprecedented opportunity to change the way Union County does business when it comes to growth and redistricting. You no longer have to be a board that reacts to growth. For the first time, the families across this county are awake, engaged, and focused on the issue of growth. And for the first time, you have the county commissioners who are not only saying that they are against redistricting, but they want to sit down at the table and talk. And they want to give you $3 million, no strings attached. 
I ask that you vote no to this plan and reconsider taking the money and buying some time to come up with a long-term solution that involves all stakeholders. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Victoria Lucione and coincidentally I live in the Victoria Lake subdivision and I'm here to speak on behalf of that subdivision with the permission of my neighbors. Although I know Marcy Savage very well, I don't know any of you all very well, so I think it's important so that you understand where I'm coming from for me to tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. My husband and I relocated our five children to the Waxhaw area in 2006. My eldest daughter was a founding member of the Marvin Ridge Middle School. I have been tirelessly involved in all three schools in our cluster since we arrived. I'm also one of those parents you haven't heard from and I gather there were some disparaging comments made about the absence of certain parents. I haven't shown up as I communicated to a principal who inquired why I had not shown up. I've not been vocal on this matter for two reasons. First of all, I felt though that my intelligent comments would be lost in the hysteria that came in the wake of the redistricting announcement. And second of all, I'm too busy volunteering in the schools to get involved in a political dispute. That said, with the redistricting looming, my neighbors asked me if I would speak. And therefore, I want to address four points. First of all, the overcrowding in our school didn't occur overnight and it's not going to get solved overnight as everyone who's spoken before me this evening has identified. This plan is akin to a crash diet for someone who is obese. People don't get fat overnight and that's why crash diets don't work overnight. Crash diets make people mentally and physically unhealthy and they don't achieve long-term results. They're not sustainable. This redistricting proposal is analogous to a crash diet. It will have a tremendous negative effect on our children, our families, our teachers, and our school and geographic communities. And this crash diet won't be sustainable long term. Instead of this crash diet redistricting plan, perhaps the school board should take a more patient approach with incremental changes coupled with identifiable social, emotional, and pedagogical goals. In other words, rather than this extreme reactive approach, the community would be better served by a more proactive approach. One that is, in accordance with your own articulated core values, customer-driven and plays more, pays more than lip service to your goal of maintaining, quote, constant, unswerving focus on students and shareholders. Which brings me to my second point. It appears that the only goal motivating this redistricting plan is to achieve certain enrollment numbers. While school and class size is undeniably important, size is but one of the numerous goals that you as fiduciaries should be striving to achieve in Union County public schools. All research on the topic unequivocally demonstrates that students who feel invested in their school communities have greater academic success and decreased disruptive and violent behavior. Any plan that overlooks this critical component of a child's development is seriously flawed. Moreover, the research also reflects that student and school success requires family investment in the school community. But that investment doesn't just materialize, it must be cultivated. Investment comes from trust in, reliability on, familiarity with, and respect for the school community. This plan destroys the investment that I and others like me have made in our schools. At least with the larger subdivisions that will be moved, the children and families have their subdivision communities to fall back on once they lose their existing school communities. Which brings me to my third point. We are one of those low impact, low density communities. Our subdivision is so small that we have no community on which to fall back. We don't have a swimming pool. We don't have a park. We have 30 lots. That's it. 
We have a total of 15 children who attend in the Marvin Ridge Cluster. Five in the elementary school, six in the middle school, and four in the high school, and we have no room for expansion. Those 15 children that will re be redistricted will have no sense of community, school or otherwise, when moved. Which is why, although I think the plan as a whole is flawed, I am here asking you to remove our subdivision from the redistricting plan. We're 15 students, and that's it. This isn't about good schools or bad schools. Good evening. My name is Jason Leake, and I am speaking on behalf of the Parent Committee for Change out of the Wellington Cluster. We are not sold on redistricting, though I know many of you on the board are. I ask for you to please keep an open mind for the next few minutes and consider a new plan that focuses on the underlying problem as opposed to treating the symptom. Chairman Yurchek, you said the Board of Education is reactive, not proactive. I understand this. New developments are approved by the county, and the BOE is tasked with how to handle the resulting demand on the educational system. And you have to do so with limited funds and other constraints, all while getting input from all directions, such as tonight. This sounds like a tough job, for sure, and I empathize with you all on the board. But it is this reactive structure that I think is the true root of our problem. I propose we give the BOE the power to tie development to educational capacity through a new development assignment plan. Here is how it might work. Rather than the developments automatically being assigned to school districts by geography, the school board would assign brand new neighborhoods to the closest available schools with sufficient available seats. In order to encourage open enrollment at schools with available seats, there could be an option for parents to transport their students to any school under capacity or at watch level. In the future, the neighborhood could apply to be reassigned to a closer school when there is capacity, just like when everyone else is reassigned when new schools are built. The busing routes for these new neighborhoods could be included for analysis prior to the school year so as not to uh, decrease busing efficiency. So those are the basics, and these are the pros of the plan. Number one, it puts the children first. It keeps current students in their school, therefore maintaining their learning environment and avoiding unnecessary disruption. It allows for the school board to be more proactive rather than reactive. It decreases the need for constant redistricting of existing homes and residents. It makes current residents more likely to vote yes to bonds and give money to school fundraisers. It pushes back on developers since currently North Carolina can't charge impact fees. This might make developers offer money, land, or building supplies if they want a newer school to attract newcomers to their neighborhood. People will know what school they are buying into before they buy their homes. It encourages municipalities to work with the school system to help plan for growth. And it minif minifies transferring teachers and resources across the county in comparison to redistricting. Now, the potential cons for this plan include possible effects on busing costs, as well as the possible need for to combine this with a minimal overcrowding fix in the short term, mainly within the clusters that are capped. Now, I do have some potential solutions to those cons in this information packet, which I will leave for you all. So now that I've covered the new development assignment plan, let me express some concerns about the current state of affairs. Number one, it makes no sense to implement a highly disrupted short-term plan right now this fast, and I'm speaking of the countywide redistricting, when the BOE has no long-term plan developed, at least not that's been communicated to the public. For example, my neighborhood, Callenwood, was redistricted to Sun Valley Middle, excuse me, it was districted to Sun Valley Middle and High, and then in 08 it was changed to Weddington, and now it is proposed to be changed back to Sun Valley. If the original plan was more long-term in nature, these back-and-forth changes could have been avoided. Likewise, moving to the present, I don't want to shuffle around 5,800 students only to have to do it again in the near-term future for lack of a long-term plan. We want to understand the long-term plan that you have in store for us before we can possibly embrace a short-term redistricting plan that might support that long-term plan. Number two, the need for transparency. There are so many reasons why the redistricting plan, at least as proposed and right now, is a bad idea, yet several board members have made their pro-redistricting stance clear from day one even before BOE working sessions have had a chance to take place. This stance has endured despite all the objections and flaws brought up by concerned community leaders. This makes me believe hidden agendas are at play. We wonder, are you somehow being influenced by developers? 
It's obvious redistricting opens up the best performing schools to new development and only benefits the newcomers. Or are you trying to average out test scores across the county to help qualify for large race to the top federal grants? Or are your actions centered around the $91 million lawsuit? Or are you just so caught up in voting for the plan that you've put so much time and effort into that you're blind to the objections and shortcomings brought up by the public? As an entrepreneur, I know it can be tough to let go of something that you put so much into, but there comes a time when you have to fish or cut bait. Now, we don't know the true agendas, of course. The lack of transparency and, quite frankly, the lip service being paid to the public right now is downright offensive. We are not as ignorant as you may think, and we would prefer to spend our time on this issue working alongside you. Think of the collective work that can be done with the help of vol volunteer analysts, attorneys, educators, and parents alike. We, your constituents, want to work with you. So in summary, I implore you to do three things. As a board, please review the new proposed assignment plan. My name is Dina Case, and I am representing the Weddington Chase subdivision. Our children attend the Marvin Ridge Cluster. Before making a final decision that involves all students in this county, I respectfully ask that you take your time and look at all the options from every angle. Weigh the positives and negatives for each option and ask yourself this. Will redistricting accomplish enough while limiting the amounts of negative impacts at all schools? The redistricting plan will affect far more than 5,800 students negatively and accomplish very little in return. There are better plans that offer better results. There are three different groups of students that will be affected by the reassignment plan. I won't bother rehashing how the 5,800 students you propose to move will be more negatively impacted. I think we can all agree that for this group of students, the negatives far outweigh the positives. Let's consider those students that will remain at their schools and see a decrease in student enrollment and ask how will they benefit from this plan. Those who support the reassignment plan have complained of trailer usage, large class sizes, and limitation to resources. But the administration said that after reassignment, trailers will remain and be used, class sizes will remain the same, and teachers will leave with transferring students. You may have heard some classrooms at Marvin Ridge Middle School are housing two classes. There are four of these classes, but none have more than 37 students, and each of these classrooms has two teachers. This is what has been used as arguments to support reassignment, yet the plan fixes not one of these complaints. Safety concerns have also been used to justify this reassignment plan. The safety issue has already been proven more than once to be invalid. The Union County Fire Marshal said that the schools can hold much higher numbers. The Weddington Chase community has never felt that our middle school was overcrowded. You all said so yourselves that you did not receive emails voicing concerns until after the cap was implemented and redistricting was on the table. Marvin Ridge Middle will add only 31 more students over the course of the next five years. That is it. Our high school and two of our elementary schools are under capacity. Why is there an urgency to redistrict here? There is no safety concern. There is no overcrowding concern. Really what this is is an inconvenience concern. The complaints that, have you that you have received are inconveniences that are common to larger schools. Let's now discuss the students who will remain at their current schools but will be affected by the influx of students coming in. I have included a spreadsheet for your viewing. It shows how each school's percent capacity changes with reassignment. These percent capacities change, capacity changes were calculated for both before and after reassignment using the worst forecasted enrollment number over the next five years. Here are some of the highlights. Of the 46 schools, 26 are over capacity even after reassignment. Only four go from over to under capacity. Seven schools go from under to, to over capacity, and six schools go from over to be, being even higher over capacity. The few improvements, if any, that we gain with reassignment are lost or outweighed by the negative impact of raising numbers everywhere else. An example, reassignment will increase Parkwood Middle School student body by 40% from 
putting it over capacity and asked that it fit 1,100 students into a cafeteria that is built for 780. On the other hand, the plan will decrease the enrollment at Marvin Ridge Middle School. Marvin Ridge has a current enrollment of 1,439, but can fit 1,632. It can fit 200 more students if needed. Why add students to schools that are smaller, older, in severe disrepair, and simply put, cannot handle the loads you are asking them to take on? The newer, larger schools are more than capable of handling larger numbers. So I ask you this question, what are we moving 5,800 students for? The reassignment plan will result in negatively impacting too many and offers little, if any, improvements to the students this plan was designed to help. Install MCRs or impl implement the K-6 through model where needed. These are two plans that may be more inconvenient to implement from an administration standpoint, but will allow students to remain in their schools and pose less negative impact to students. Students should be our first priority. At the very least, please sit down and have these candid discussions with each other at your next work session. It is what you were elected to do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Dr. Ellis. My name is Chris Maupin, and I reside in Wesley Chapel, and I'm here this evening representing the Quintessa subdivision. We ask that you table the redistricting proposal currently being considered, or at the very least, delay such wide-reaching action. Enrollment projections for the next couple of years simply do not warrant displacing so many students, families, and communities. Roughly 5,800 students, over 150 neighborhoods, and 37 schools would be impacted to address a problem that is so small in relation. Why pursue a course of action that seems to assure maximum disruption when simpler localized solutions are readily available and even advantageous to growth and development? Furthermore, we assert that large-scale redistricting at this time will simply beget more redistricting in a few years. The establishment of sufficient central services has not kept pace with the growth in residential housing in some areas. Under the proposed plan, many clusters and communities would be negatively impacted due to the uncoordinated municipal planning of a few. The plan under consideration moves students east and south while clearing spots for additional uncontrolled development in the west. This simply enables more of the same behavior going forward and punishes the many for the sins of the few. As much as we all want to see equity among schools throughout Union County, it is disingenuous to portray this as the case today. The Weddington, Marvin, and Cuthbertson clusters are the most desirous by families looking to move into the area and clearly command a premium. Pushing current students out to make way for anticipated new students will further perpetuate the current cycle that is at the root of the problem. This is not a sustainable approach to managing growth and infrastructure nor is it equitable to the broader county. We ask instead that the board renegotiate any constraints on the three million dollar offer that would prevent you from employing any of a number of approaches to forestall redistricting. We fully understand that there is a degree of strain in the relationship between the Board of Education and the Board of County Commissioners in no small part due to the ongoing resolution of the lawsuit. However, given the gravity of the situation it is incumbent upon the two bodies to come together and resolve any remaining obstacles with this offer. We would appreciate communication about a resolution to this matter. When might, when might we expect this? These monies would be sufficient to cover the cost of MCRs, capping and busing, or other more precise solutions that are absent of broader countywide implications. This should provide a few years to construct a more robust long-term plan. During a recent work session, such a plan was alluded to, and we anticipate hearing the details at tomorrow night's meeting. To summarize, we believe you should table the redistricting plan as currently proposed. It's simply not warranted at this time. Do whatever it takes to work out the $3 million opportunity with the Board of County Commissioners. It can provide near-term relief locally and where the issues lie. Avoid actions that further enable uncontrolled growth in certain areas. It will only lead to more of the same, and it disrupts many to accommodate relatively few, including those that don't even reside here yet. Capping and busing in these areas, for instance, would encourage sound planning and bring stability and certainty across the county. 
We're not sure how you interpret your responsibility as elected officials and members of this board. Some may feel that they were elected to make decisions for us. That's not the case. Rather, you were elected to represent our interests. Listen to the speakers tonight. Read your emails. Read the many resolutions against redistricting from affected municipalities. We think you are hearing quite clearly what our interests are. You have our input, and now we ask that you represent us accordingly. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to address you tonight. Good evening, board members. My name is Paul Frost, and I live in Stallings in the Collinwood neighborhood, and my family is being uh, affected by this redistricting proposal. I recently completed a term on the Stallings Town Council, and as you may know, the Stallings Town Council and other municipalities unanimous, unanimously sent a message that they opposed the redistricting plan. I would like to speak in regard to my experience as a town council member in, for four years. And, and ask that you uh, consider my experiences in relation to what you're doing. First of all, I learned that collaboration is best. Uh, as a town council, we, we came across many issues in regards to municipalities, county, state, and federal issues. We found that when we are willing to sit down with other bodies and collaborate and find uh, resolutions and solutions to problems that face us, it worked out much better. You have the opportunity to do that right now. The, for example, the Stellings Town Council just last week voted to postpone any development on Lawyers Road, uh, a residential proposed residential development, because uh, they wanted to see what you would have to say about that. You have the municipality's attention now. You don't need to go forward with this proposal. It's time to sit down and collaborate with the municipalities and with other factors of growth and stakeholders and find better alternatives to this. The second thing I learned is that it's best to listen to voters, especially those that come and fill the room with concerned citizens. I learned, I saw for two election cycles in my experience as a town council member, that when the board didn't listen, the next election cycle, there was a change, a, a dramatic change, and in fact, uh, Mr. Yerchek, I met you at the uh, a polling place uh, for the town council member who, who actually lost. And that, to me, was an indication of dissatisfaction of voters. I think you'll find that in the next election there will be major changes because of the direction that you've taken if you go forward with this proposal. So I ask you to please just listen to the voters. There are many intelligent and willing people who would like to sit down and help us solve the problem. The Songs Town Council and others re recognized that uh, we were part of the problem that led to this situation. But now the council members and others want to be part of the solution. So I ask you to please don't go forward with this plan, but sit down and find another alternative. Thank you very much. Scott Drums from Marvin. Uh, disappointed, disgusted, encouraged. These are all different emotions that I have felt during the last year in regards to the state of affairs in Union County, Union County Schools, and the redistricting situation. I am disappointed that our elected officials have not come forward with a viable, long-term solution to the supposed school crowding problem. I am disgusted at the childish interaction between the elected officials of the Board of Education and the Board of County Commissioners. Please be leaders and lead by example. I'm also disgusted at the apparent disinterest of some of the elected officials on this board who apparently ignore the exact same people that elected them to office. You have not worked with the stakeholders in the system who have demonstrated a willingness even an eagerness to help the board evaluate various options. One school official was credited with a comment along the lines of where have all the Johnny-come-latelys been on other school issues? Well, 
we, we have been devoting our time and resources at our kids' schools, volunteering in classrooms, helping run after-school programs, helping run fundraisers and booster events, working on campuses during beautification days, etc. You need to understand you have underestimated the passion with which we parents will protect our children. When faced with times of a lack of leadership, a community can do one of two things. It can spiral into chaos, or its members can step up and not allow the community to fail. This is where I have been encouraged. Countless members of the Union County community, across cluster and neighborhood lines, across racial and political lines, have banded together, have given generously of their time, given up time at work, given up time with their families to come together and have a healthy debate and discussion about redistricting and potential solutions, long-term solutions. These solutions have been proposed to members of this board who seemingly, seemingly dismiss them without any probing questions to evaluate their validity. Those of us gathered here tonight and thousands more within the community want to make this very clear. We have been here, we are here, and we will be here in the future. It is your choice to involve us in the process or not. So soon the alarm will sound and I will run out of speaking time, so let me close with this. For those of you that have been characterized publicly as closed-minded, ignored calls for meetings, and demonstrated that you'll bully your views onto other members of the board, hear this. We will be heard. Listen to us now and work with us or hear from us in the not-too-distant future when we walk into voting booths and tell you what our opinion is. Hello, I'm Kathy Bailey Califf. I live at 109 Castlestone Lane in the Blackstone subdivision. Thanks for all you do. It's nice to see you all in person and know that you're real. Usually I'm rushing into these meetings from work late and I'm always in the overflow room. So I'm usually seeing you on a screen. It's nice to know you're here and we do appreciate what you do. I have three great kids who are part of the Weddington High School family. We really do consider it a family. Um, we're involved in so many things, cross country, marching band, track, FBLA, National Honor Society Beta Club. It really is a big part of our lives. Um, we live in Blackstone and we urge you to say no to redistricting. Uh, I believe in neighborhood schools. We live 1.9 miles from Weddington. It's only 1.9 miles there. Our new school where we district to is two and a half times that distance. It's five miles away. It just doesn't make sense. I hear so many stories over and over about people that are passing by other schools, uh, maybe three and four schools closer, going to further away schools. And, and it just really doesn't make sense. Um, did you know that right now um, rising freshmen are being invited to high school open houses this month? So um, the timing on this, I mean, where do they go? Should they go to the new open house? It's, it's all just late. It's rushed and it's late. And I urge you really to reconsider um, the redistricting proposal. Um, this is just not the time. The Kroll Report and several other speakers tonight um, have pointed out discrepancies in the numbers. I'm really not going to you know, give you all the numbers, but I just want to urge you to consider that there are errors in these numbers. Um, and why are we moving 5,800 students to solve a 500 student problem? The MCR has no strings attached. Let's not move 14% of the students just for a 1.4% student issue. It just doesn't make sense. Recently at work, someone said to me, aren't you glad that redistricting is over? And with the MCR offer, and I said, no, the Board of Education has refused this offer. They were incredulous. They just, they really didn't even believe me. It took them about a week to really realize that I really was telling them the truth, that the offer was refused. They just didn't make sense. From an outsider looking in, it just doesn't make sense. It's a great offer. I urge you to consider the other offers. Redistricting is such a dramatic change to these 5,800 students entrenched in their, in their schools, entrenched in their schools as a family with passion and pride for their schools. I urge you to keep an open mind, look at some options, and vote no to redistricting. Thank you.
in this call. We're going to take a 15 minute break. Hi, my name is Erin Kirkpatrick. I've been a Union County resident and voter since 2003. My address is 8111 Red Oaks Trail, Waxhaw, North Carolina, 28173. My telephone number is 704-989-4322. Elected members of the board and members of staff, I stand before you tonight with no dog in this fight. I am not an elected official or running for an elected office. I do not have a child in the Union County public school system and have no plans of selling my home yet I avidly oppose this redistricting. We believe this course of action to address growth is both unfounded and unwarranted at this time. The Union County Board of Education has failed to make its case for redistricting. The sudden emergence aligns with the Union County Public Schools failure to meet an 8% academic improvement promised by the state of North Carolina when it accepted nearly $400 million for the Race to the Top grant linked to the National Common Core curriculum. This fast track timing has long since passed the board's own policy of a December decision timeline for proper reassignment policy, excuse me, reassignment notice, albeit perfect timing for upcoming elections and their primaries to a skeptical audience. As elected officials, you, John Crowder, Kevin Stewart, Richard Yurchek, Rick Pig, John Collins, Marcy Savage, Michael Guzman, Christina Helms, Sherry Hodges are charged with the task of planning adequate school space for our children and quality ed education for all of the children in our wonderful school system. It should not go without saying that redistricting is the single most difficult task you will face while serving on this board. This is a hydra-headed problem with fractured county relations requiring a unique solution. Redistricting students from highest performing schools into the lowest performing schools only masks the need for improved education in the receiving schools. These schools need your support. These children need every opportunity to succeed. These children need skills and trades to give them the best chance of success in life and meaningful employment for themselves, their children, and the future of our community. Magnet schools can attract children to choose attendance at a non-neighborhood school, perhaps Spanish language immersion in an appropriate school, and an aviation magnet school in another would offer viable trades. Offering greater access to an early start program for pre-kindergartners would make a meaningful difference in these children's lives with an added foundational year. Focus on what you can do for them. Be the servant leaders we elected you to be and help them soar. Redistricting merely hides them. You may believe there is a growth problem at present, but that can only be solved by redistricting. Please ask yourselves why nearly 6,000 children are being moved, caps raised at receiving schools and vacancies left in losing schools. School vacancies created by ripping happy children out of their schools for unbuilt neighborhoods is egregious. Please consider alternatives and creative solutions we ele elected you to explore. We will help you advocate for the funding you so desperately need from the county and the state. In closing, we the people submit the petition to stop the redistricting of Union County Public Schools with 10,250 signatures, representing far greater than 20% depth of opposition. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lynette Vaughn, and I am speaking for my Callenwood neighbors. I am not an expert in education, but being an actuary for the last 20 years, you can say I'm somewhat of an expert in numbers, data, and forecasts. Does the following sound familiar? The pursuit of quality and educational performance goals of the organization requires that process management be based on reliable data, information, and knowledge gained through careful and systematic analysis. It should. It comes directly from the board's core value, management by fact. Okay, let's look at the facts. The current redistricting proposal is based directly on the population forecast prepared by Dr. McKibben. Let it be known that Dr. McKibben has stated that this report should not be used for redistricting purposes, and yet it is. Per the report, the largest driver of the increased enrollment is due to in-migration from other areas. This can be correlated to the building and purchasing of homes in the district. Let's look at some of the assumptions used that contribute to the enrollment numbers. The study assumes interest rates will not fluctuate more than 1% in the short term, and 30-year mortgages rates will stay below 5% for the next 10 years. Experts disagree with this, as artificially low interest rates cannot be maintained when the Fed fully ends quantitative easings, which could occur as early as 2015. Mortality rates continue contribute to the housing turnover and are kept constant throughout the forecast period. Common actuarial practices instead reflect future mortality improvements. Adding improvements would reduce the number of deaths and the number of resale homes available for in-migration. Mortgage approval rates are assumed to remain at historical levels, 
Lenders do not return to subprime lending, and no restrictions are placed on home mortgage lenders. Although it is true that subprime lending will not likely return, the recent rise in interest rates and additional regulatory restrictions has reduced mortgage expectations. Lastly, the study does not take into account a major factor, new charter schools. There are at least three charter schools that have filed applications in and anticipate 2,000 students in 2015 and close to 3,000 students in 2019. All of these assumptions, when modified to reflect appropriate future expectations, would decrease the projected enrollment at our schools. Note, even with the report's aggressive assumptions regarding growth and the omission of charters, the overcrowding numbers are small. If we continue to look at other data that is being relied upon, we see that the overcrowding is even smaller than that being presented. Analysis of capacity, watch, and cap levels of the individual schools has led to some interesting observations. The watch and cap levels for select schools after reassignment were increased from the before reassignment levels. How does this happen? Which numbers are correct? Why are the increases only for the schools that students are being moved into? To, the, to make the numbers look better in support of redistricting seems like smoke and mirrors to me. Watch levels are generally plus 100 students when compared to capacity. For larger capacity schools, the increases are actually plus 150 or plus 200. Makes sense as watch levels should be proportionate to the core capacity of the school. So applying a percentage increase rather than a delta is logical. However, this is not applied consistently. Why does Monroe Middle, with a capacity of 1,000 students, have a watch level of 1,200, but Weddington Middle, also with a capacity of 1,000, only have a watch level of 1,150? Why the inequity? Which watch levels are correct? Where is the careful systematic analysis? Cap levels are strictly set at plus 100 compared to the watch level. Why not some correlation to capacity like the watch levels? A school with capacity of 800 students is capped at 125 percent of capacity, but a school with 1,200 students is capped at 116 percent of capacity. This math does not add up. If you modify the before reassignment watch levels to be consistent among schools with similar capacity, many of the schools that appear over the cap before assignment are actually under the cap throughout the forecast. These numbers do not lie. It also shows that there are only six schools that may trigger a cap during the forecast period, and most of the excesses are within McKibben's margin of error. However, when we apply reasonable assumptions and methods, these schools will most likely stay under the caps without redistricting. And after the five-year bubble has passed, the enrollment numbers are actually declined. The newer, higher-performing schools are being reduced in size to be below capacity where the older, lower-performing schools are being brought above their, over their capacity and even to the watch levels. You are over-relieving the perceived overcrowding in one area and pushing into another which cannot structurally handle it. Further, McKibben report already reflects the impact of continued future growth in the forecast and enrollment numbers. Then why are you leaving additional seats open by underutilizing these newer schools? Are you implying that the McKibben report is wrong and that there are expected significantly more inflow than forecasted? then who exactly are you leaving these seats open for? It is obviously not my child. There is more inconsistent data that I do not have time to discuss here. If I use this quality of data at my job, I would be fired. These are the facts we are basing the redistricting plan on. What happened to basing decisions on reliable data and applying systematic? Thank you.
fire away. <laughs> Number 26, Mary Carinato, and number 47, Gloria Bidrich. Actually, that's Mary Tarando. Tarando, thank you. Yep. I, I understand the last name like you're saying. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Tarando. I live in Hunter Oaks, which is in the Marvin Ridge cluster, and I am a new resident. And my daughter is one of the six children that are currently capped out of Marvin Ridge that travel 17 miles across this lovely county to go across the street to Parkwood. So as long as you, the, the road you travel to come all the way down here, my daughter makes that journey twice a day to and from. Okay. Okay? Right. And my son is meant, if the enrollment cap stays, my son will be faced with that because he's in fifth grade this year, sixth grade next year. Okay. Now, in reviewing the McKibben report, the enrollment versus capacity worksheet figures from released in November 2013, as well as the, the facilities committee proposals, these um, post uh, redistricting, again, I agree with the actuarial person who just spoke who said that noticed the same kind of interesting trends, namely that you all have arbitrarily increased the capacities across all the schools in the county, elementary, middle, and high school, in most cases up to 200 students per school. Okay, so you have been able to just conjure up the additional capacity without any temporary classrooms, any building works, any expansion proposals, or anything. How does that work exactly? Okay, so how are we able to trust any facts or figures that you are putting out to us at the moment? How can you increase capacities so arbitrarily? Okay, and then why, and, and why then can you not increase the capacity now? Lift the enrollment cap now, accept the $3 million, Get those temporary classrooms in, which can add a relevant solution to increase capacities which are sorely needed here and now. 
Incidentally, people are not selling their homes in the Marvin Ridge area because who wants to buy into this area because of the enrollment cap? Therefore, you have stopped the natural movement in and out of this area because of this misguided capping policy, which has absolutely no relevance because of capacity or safety. Those arguments have been laid to rest tonight, hopefully. Okay. So, the way the capping policy also that has been implemented has been grossly unfair. No consultation period, no notice period, no appeals process, no transitional period, nothing. One day it was here, or one day it wasn't there, the next day it was not. Please remove the cap. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gloria Friedrich. I relocated to Union County over 15 years ago and currently live in Wesley Chapel. When our family moved here, we chose our neighborhood so that our sons could attend Weddington schools. As a real estate agent, I know people choose to live in Union County for many reasons. Some like the lower taxes or rural feel, but most people will tell me they want to move here because of the schools. Before people choose a place to live, they research school performance, programs offered, sports offered, etc. They do their homework, so to speak, before they start their home search. Some will even spend more for a house just so their children can attend a certain school. Once in the school, parents, children, and teachers all become part of a community working together to make their school the best it can be. This is evident in the school spirit and pride at many of the schools in Union County and the fun, rival fun rivalry between them. During the time my sons attended Wesley Chapel and Weddington Middle and High, there were some periods of major overcrowding with, some, with whole grade levels being spent in mobile classrooms. This did not take away from their school experience or learning. They did not feel unsafe or slighted. They were with their friends. This was their school. And when both graduated from Weddington High School, I know they did not remember the overcrowding, but the fun years spent at their community school with friends they had made in grade school. A decision to tell home homeowners that they can, are no longer going to be in the school district that they meticulously chose to live in, buy or build a house in, to become part of a community in, when it was most likely the number one reason they chose to live there is not fair to the taxpayer, or the school community and does nothing to solve what will continue to be an overcrowding problem in the schools. Union County has enjoyed the benefit of having people relocate here and if the current proposal is put in place, I believe people will think twice about moving to a county where their child's school can be changed by a swift decision one day. Who of us would make a financial financial investment in an unstable environment that ultimately affects our children. No one. I believe this current proposal is not a redistricting proposal, but a reshuffling proposal and does not benefit anyone. Not the children in the overcrowded schools, not the children in the schools that need repairs, not teachers, not the continued success of the school's rankings, not the homeowners, and not the county. I urge you to please take the needed time to consider other options and long-term fixes before making a final decision that will impact all aspects that make people want to continue to move, live, and attend the schools in Union County. I live in Weddington Chase. My children are moving from the Marvin Cluster to the Weddington Cluster. While they are being moved from one great school to another, this type of change is very challenging for all students, especially middle school and high school students. My greatest fear is that my children will move to Weddington only to be moved again in another two years because Weddington becomes overcrowded. A long-range plan needs to be developed that will accommodate growth for at least five years. Based on the numbers that are currently being presented, this redistricting plan may only accommodate growth for a couple of years. This community cannot be asked to go through this again. It is tearing the community apart. 
I implore you to do your due diligence to develop a plan that we can all live with for the next five years at least. Perhaps that involves mobile classrooms, adding to existing schools or building new schools. Perhaps it does involve redistricting, but please make that choice cautiously and with numbers that can withstand this growing community for many years. If you insist on doing this, please consider grandfathering as many high school students as possible, especially rising juniors. Seniors, of course, are already included. The junior year is extremely important as students prepare to apply for college. The transition to a new school environment with new teachers and guidance counselors and administrators will make this time even more difficult. In summary, please be sure to do Please be sure whatever you do is something that you can commit to as a long-term answer. Please be sure that the best interests of the students are what this decision is based on. My name is Kathy Heintel. I'm the current president of the Wesley Chapel Elementary PTO. Over the last five years, the PTO has provided Wesley Chapel Elementary with approximately $200,000 in much needed funds for items such as computers, tutoring, Promethean boards, globalization, playgrounds, to name a few. These are not frivolous, frivolous items. However, we just completed a fundraiser that we have done for three years. Our proceeds are down almost 30 percent. I believe that Union County parent organizations and booster clubs will see declines in donations in the years to come if this redistricting plan is approved. If we are constantly under the threat of being reassigned, people will not feel vested in their current school. There will be no continuity and no community. Therefore, I believe funds for schools provided by these parents' organizations will not be available to our schools due to your actions. How do you intend to fill that void? You have bungled this entire redistricting process. On January 14th, you exploded a bomb on the entire UP UCPS community and then acted surprised that people were upset. The responsible, responsible approach would have been to first identify the problem to the public with clear support showing why the situation is a problem, then systematically review the options for solving that problem. Instead, you started with one drastic solution to something that is yet to be clearly shown to be a problem. Only when some members of the board began to ask questions did Dr. Ellis and Dr. Webb go back and superficially look at some of the other options. You continue to play hide the ball with the public. The cap numbers were changed on the oldest middle schools to make your after redistricting chart look better. No one was told that the numbers were changed and no one thinks that they need to explain why. The UCPS staff has yet to comply with public record requests made five weeks ago for public records showing why these numbers have changed or to many other records requests to which state law and your own board policy compel a response. We are being stonewalled despite claims to the contrary. Your actions speak louder than words. At the February 4th board meeting at Marvin Ridge High School, I had the opportunity to have a short conversation with board member John Collins prior to the meeting. I express to you my concern that your districting plan overcrowds the older schools. In fact, according to your school's own spreadsheet, Sun Valley High School would be overwatch level and only 50 students away from cap level one year into your plan. Mr. Collins' response was, so we'll just redistrict again. That's your plan? Continue to redistrict every couple years? The message is clear. If you haven't been affected this time, you will be in the future. And those of us who are affected this time will likely be affected again. It is clear that, the, that most of the board and the administration are not looking at long term. Dr. Ellis, you have stated that you are concerned about how transitions impact our children. Frankly, Dr. Ellis, that's just lip service. Instead of being re reactive, start being proactive. Please develop a long-term strategic plan with the input of all your stakeholders. Create an environment where everyone is encouraged to speak, including parents, teachers, staff, and members of your own board. There is no downside to a measured, proactive approach, but there is an enormous downside to your current draconian proposal. Do the right thing. Vote no. I am Carolyn Bowers and I thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. You may not consider your plan to be mandatory busing, but it sure feels like it. As a young student, I was bused out of my community school and I promised I would never do the same thing to my children. There are better ways to provide each student with a quality education, a seat in their community school, and a plan for a successful educational future. I quote to you, 
since the 1980s, desegregation busing has been in decline. Busing in some cases took students many miles away from their homes, which often presented problems to them and their families. In addition, many families were angry about having to send their children miles to another school in an unfamiliar neighborhood when there was an available school a short distance away. Large numbers of white families moved to the suburbs. It was called white flight, and this reduced the effectiveness of the policy. Many whites who stayed moved their children into private or parochial schools. These effects combined reduce any effectiveness mandatory busing may have had. Is this our exact situation? I'm not sure, but it sure feels like it. I am concerned the current reassignment plan will lead to segregation of schools again. Higher performing schools will become whiter and lower performing schools will become more black and brown. The school we are in currently is gradually becoming more diverse and we are enjoying the effect that it is having. I do not believe this reassignment plan is the dream that Dr. King shared with us. This is not the way to solve overcrowding or educational inequality in this century. Number one, as the leaders of our educational institution, bring the educational and economic equality to the students where they are, in their communities, with 21st century excellent administrators that have proven they know how to lead successfully. We are a 21st century school, aren't we? Number two, stop pulling seats out from under students while they are still sitting in them. In school, that, we are told that that's a bully. Number three, use the open seats in our schools for students that have not arrived yet and use the mobile classrooms to support CAP clusters within their own communities. Now, I must give credit where credit is due. Every punch thrown between you and the BOCC of disrespect during the litigation and now with the community with this reassignment proposal has been felt by every one of our children. As the appointed and elected leaders of our educational institution, your punches have hurt the most. No one wants to buy a house in Union County right now, so don't worry about overcrowding. You've taken care of that. Thank you. I've been trying to understand why Dr. Ellis and a majority of the Board of Education favors redistricting. My questions and emails have gone unanswered or ignored, so I am left to my own devices to try and figure out why this redistricting is being forced on us. The only reason that I can come up with is because you have your own agenda. My perception is that the Board of Education is using this redistricting as an opportunity to try and bolster test scores in some of their lower performing schools. North Carolina is a recipient of federal grant money from a program titled Race to the Top. This $330 million federal program pays monies to school districts that meet certain educational criteria. Union County Public School has received a little over $1.2 million from this grant and has recently promoted Tom Bula as a new head of this program. At the time of this application, six of our nine high schools were performing above the state average and the lower three performing schools were only lower by at most 15.8 points. Now, only five of our schools are above the state average. The four lower performing schools are lower by as much as 25.8 points. This not only shows a decrease in the number of schools above the state average, it also shows a huge decrease in the performance in the lower schools. Even with this decrease in those scores, the county will still get stipends for all teachers whose scores go up next year. Of the eight high schools that are being redistricted, in all but one case, the students are being moved from newer, higher performing schools to older, lower performing schools. Once all the 5,800 students are forced to move to different schools, there will most likely be an improvement of test scores. This will then make it appear as though Union County has managed to improve the education for their poorest performing schools, while in reality, all they have done is shuffled students. Another thing I would like to point out is that the current administration and the Board of Education says that we need to redistrict because we have no money to support other options. How is this possible when based on the UCPS 
federal budgets, the county carried over $3.5 million in its Title I, II, and III budgets and then received close to another $5 million in those areas this year. Both the race to the top money and the federal money is designed to support lower performing schools. However, it doesn't seem that they are getting the financial support they need, especially when you look at the expenditures to date for the race to the top money and your Title I, II, and III dollars, which are in the millions, but seem to get, get carried over from year to year. It seems that my perception might be reality, that this redistricting is being used to bring up test scores in lower performing schools rather than allocate funds needed to be successful. Good evening. My name is Trent Taylor. I'm representing Chestnut Place. And uh, wow, we've heard a lot of opinions tonight, haven't we? Um, I haven't been taking an exact tally, but it looks like uh, the no's have it for redistricting, against redistricting. Um, but a lot of different opinions. Some people against mobiles, some people against redistricting, but only in their backyard. I'm against redistricting as a proud parent of two boys, Sam and Jake Taylor, at Antioch. I'm against redistricting for all kids. And it's bad. And here's why. Redistricting at face value is an overly complex solution, an extreme solution to a short-term problem. It's akin to taking a sledgehammer when the proper tool for the job is a pair of tweezers. Let's look at the numbers. You've already seen these, but anytime I see something where you're going to uproot 14% of the population to solve a problem that's 1 to 1.4% 1 of the bubble that's going to go through, we need to look at other options. Whenever something is this extreme and so asymmetric as far as the weight of the solution you're proposing versus the weight of the problem, you're going to have two things. Number one, your known costs. And number two, your unintended consequences. Your known costs are going to be the fees for the buses. We've talked about this a little bit, but we know that the kids are going to be traveling, increased travel of 275,000 miles per school year. That's an additional cost of 1.5 mil annual cost. The state's not going to pay for that. Where is that going to come from? What budget is that going to come from? What sacrifices are you going to have to make to fund that busing? Number two, the risk of unintended consequences. We've talked about the safety concerns of busing kids these additional miles. We've seen stats about a child is 85 times more likely to die in a school bus accident in North Carolina than in a tornado, regardless of the structure. That's a known statistic. Number two, what's the psychological impact to kids multiplied on this larger base, and not just the kids moving, but the friends of those kids that are staying in those schools that are losing their friends, because they happen to live across the street. This is a real cost that will need to be borne by students and taxpayers. So with such an asymmetric solution that you've been looking at so hard, why haven't we seen more attention paid to much simpler solutions? Well, number one, you know, of course I'm going to bring up the mobile classrooms, right? Is it a long-term plan? Of course not. It's a short-term solution to buy time to build a long-term strategic plan. When we look at it as a short-term solution, we see that we'll only need 12 additional mobile units in the next year in four different schools. In fact, mobile classrooms were presented by Dr. Webb and Dr. Ellis as a viable option as recently as January 23rd, cited a cost of $2.9 million over three years, and it would eliminate the need for capping as well as redistricting for five years. I'm sold. So why aren't we doing that? The only obstacle was funding. Darn, I don't have $3 million in my pocket. But we as taxpayers actually do. And for some reason, that $3 million that was offered up by the BOCC is now being in debate as having strings attached. And I don't think anyone in this room is clear as to what those strings are or understand why those strings are perceived to be attached. The other option I would invite you guys to look at are grandfathering addresses and cluster meaning uh, when a sales contract is in place by the time the school year starts, as long as there are seats in that school, they're grandfathered in that cluster. Buyers know what to expect when they move in. Number one, this is already cited uh, by at least one BOE member as an option for discussion. Number two, this aligns the burden of additional busing miles to the source of the problem, which is unbridled development in strong performing clusters. What I like about this solution is it sets the stage for a longer term solution is that puts the economic pressure on the developers and builders that are at the source of the problem. It encourages them to participate in the school solutions they are selling 
and may even encourage development toward less crowded clusters. The problem with the current redistricting plan is this. You're opening up nearly 2,500 seats in Marvin Cuthbert's and Porter Ridge clusters for developers to profit on. This pattern is underwriting their inventory. I invite you to break the cycle of the BOE reacting to growth patterns with painful redistricting. Take a proactive approach, BOE. Lead. Be the wolf. We did not elect you to roll over and be bullied by circumstances. Do the right thing and vote no on redistricting. Good evening. My name is Kendall Smith from the neighborhood of Providence Hills in the Weddington Cluster. I am here this evening because I feel as though students should be able to speak out and give their opinion on the topic of redistricting. As a seventh grader at Weddington Middle School, moving was never something I thought I should be concerned about. I always thought that I would graduate from Weddington High School, go off to college, and live happily ever after. Eventually, I would come back for high school reunions and meet up with old friends. However, it never seemed to cross my mind that the people I'm sitting in class with today won't be sitting there with me 20 years from now celebrating a class reunion or even walking across the middle school graduation stage with me a year from now. I've been a student in Union County since kindergarten. My family and our friends have been so loyal to UCPS and I find it unfair that after everything the Union County community has given to Union County, we have been treated with this. Nobody wants to move or lose friends, and nobody wants to start over every few years. When I think about my future, I have some pretty big plans, and it will all start the day that I walk across the graduation stage with my cap and gown on. I always pictured that day with all of my friends together for one last time, all as warriors. Not with a few of us as warriors, a few of us as Spartans, and others graduating from private schools because they left Union County after this redistricting. I pictured us all as warriors, and for me to think about it any other way is unbearable. This past weekend, I went up to Bloomington, Indiana, where the campus of Indiana University is located. Indiana University is my dream school, not just because my family went there, but because being a dedicated fan is something that's just natural for me. You see, for everyone here, dedication is something that they have all given to their schools, and going to their schools are just a natural part of them. If Union County truly wants the best option possible for the children, then do not redistrict for the sake of the children's emotional stability. Quite often, I will tell my family and friends that I cannot wait until the day I go to college. Why, you might ask? Because when I'm there, no one can take it away from me. I can spend every single second that I'm there enjoying it, not worrying about whether or not I'm going to go to school there the next year or even the year after that. I can just enjoy it and have fun. That's not how I feel in Union County. I guess the choice you make isn't mine. However, it is my education. Just remember that the education of thousands of students is in your hands. The healthy well-being of students is in your hands. And the entire community of Union County is relying on you to make the right choice. But no matter what choice you make, I will always be a wildcat and warrior. And that is certainly something you cannot take away from me. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alyssa Biancardi, and I live at 2418 Providence Hills Drive, Union County. When I heard the words redistricting, I was traumatized. I cried my eyes out for days and nights. The same thoughts rang through my head. What school will I go to? What about my friends? Why are they doing this to us? We're not slate pawns for the board game. For we're not slate pawns for the board for a board game where you can just move us anywhere. Middle school is hard enough, having to worry about getting good grades, bullying peer pressure, making friends, or just trying to discover who you really are. I've been to Antioch Elementary and went to middle school, and they've helped create the person I am today. I received amazing education, positive influences, friends, and a living journey throughout my schools. I'm a seventh grader at Wangton Middle School. I'm an honor student, student council representative, and a middle school soccer player. Next year, I'll have to play my old teammates on the soccer team that just got lucky that they didn't get redistricted this time. Dr. Ellis, what's the real reason for redistricting? Do you truly think moving 5,800 students to different schools is the right thing? 
Do you know how much this really impacts us? Have you even thought about asking us or thought of us in this whole situation? Go back to when you were in middle school and how hard it was to be in this wild jungle. It's even hard today with all the technology that kids take advantage of, such as cyberbullying, stealing identities, stalking, or even just being rude without having a face. Can't you have some empathy and try walking in our shoes? School's my main priority. After God and my family, school's the most important thing to me. Why tell us in the middle of our school year, during all my tests and projects, that I may not be at my school next year? How am I supposed to focus on anything when the whole school was buzzing with this terrible news? I tried to study, but it's hard not to think about never seeing my best friends again. You didn't even have enough time for families to think about what will we do if we get redistricted. Kendall Smith and Cindy Ayers are two of my very best friends. We've been the three amigos since we were six. We have been together in the good times and bad. Once we got to sixth grade at WMS, we planned to have a big high school graduation party together with all things Weddington green so we could remember our wonderful and blessed childhood as Weddington students before we went our separate ways. We have every detail planned out from who would be invited to what type of cake we would have. If you redistrict us, we'll all be going to different schools. I'd lose both of them and all my friends. Most of all, our graduation dream will be crushed. Is that what you want to do? Crush three innocent girls' dreams. My future is in your hands, and I pray every night you do the right thing and vote no for redistricting. Thank you. I'm Chip. I'm sorry, did you is Hannah here? I guess we're okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Thank you, Board of Education, for the opportunity to be heard tonight. As the parents of students affected by the proposed redistricting have been anxious to be heard. We would also appreciate some answers to the questions that are being asked tonight in the forthcoming meetings over the next weeks. My family has lived in Wesley Chapel for eight and a half years, and we chose our home based on access to the Weddington School Cluster specifically. The same, I'm sure, is true for many families in the area. Maybe not Weddington, but Marvin Ridge or one of the other schools. Our U.S. Declaration of Independence talks about the pursuit of happiness as one of each, each citizen's inalienable rights. John Locke, English philosopher, and the person credited with the concept had the following to say about the role of government in the lives of its citizens. The pursuit of happiness is also the foundation of political liberty. Since God has given everyone the desire to pursue happiness as a natural right, the government should not interfere with anyone's pursuit of happiness so long as it doesn't interfere with others' rights to pursue happiness. The Union County Public Schools Board of Education proposed school redistricting is a tremendous interference in the 6,000 students and their families affected by the redistricting and their pursuit of happiness and should not be promoted further by the Board of Education. The redistricting would put undue interference in our lives in the form of moving our children from higher quality schools to in some cases lower quality schools as ranked by NC schools report cards, moving our children away from friends they have made over the last years as the ladies before me so eloquently stated causing significant reduction in our home values in some cases. Conservatively, as a group, it's more than $20 million impact. And I have numbers behind how I derive that. Why is the BOE considering this? To make room for future residents and their children. This point is extremely hard to accept. What happens with future growth? The redistricting plan does not address the root cause of the problem and therefore is inadequate. The lack of planning between the towns, the county, and the BOE is the root cause of the problem. The letter from H. Ligon Bundy to Mr. Richard Schwartz, Board of Education attorney dated February 19, 2014, clearly states there are no strings attached to the offer for $3 million for mobile classrooms. 
I urge you to please take the BOCC up on their offer and install the Nessie MCRs for 2014-2015 school year and start working on longer term plans. The first of those should be immediately repair and improve the quality of lesser performing county schools with meaningful fixes, not shuffling of students to bring the lower schools up. Build more capacity in the school clusters that need it. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Okay, thank you. My name is Sabrina Mitchell. I'm a ninth grader at Weddington High School. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Webb, Mr. Crowder, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Pig, Ms. Helms, Mr. Yurchek, Mrs. Savage, Mr. Collins, Mr. Guzman, and Mrs. Hodges for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you this evening. I am speaking for the 31 students in Wesley Chase against the redistricting effort. Our neighborhood is located on Waxhaw Indian Trail Road near the shops at Wesley Chapel. This is the only thing separating Wesley Chase and the proposed boundary of the Weddington Cluster. Wesley Chase is a neighborhood of 30 houses with no ability for expansion. We are only 1.8 miles from our current schools. There are only 31 in our neighborhood, I repeat, 31. 11 in elementary, 7 in middle, and 13 in high school. Mr. Guzman, how would 31 students make an impact on overcrowding? Every single student in Wesley Chase has moved within the last two years. Most have relocated from other states, leaving our family and friends, and for some, entire support systems behind. New beginnings are difficult for everyone, let alone for school-aged children. We have all adjusted to our new schools, teachers, and made friends. I believe I'm the new student in Wesley Chase, buying our house in July of last year. With the redistricting proposal, I will go to my third school within a year. One of the reasons our parents moved us here was the Weddington School District. They chose Weddington. Dr. Ellis, why should we be moved out of a school that our parents handpicked for us? Sun Valley, which we'd be moved to, is 5.8 miles away. A bus ride to increase from 15 minutes to a minimum of 45 minutes to an hour, depending on stops. We will have to get up earlier and come home later. The middle school is dismissed at 10 till 4. With an hour bus ride, that means some aren't getting home until almost 5 p.m. Our parents encourage us to participate in extra extracurricular activities as well. Ms. Helms, if your son was 11 years old and got off the bus at 5 p.m., would he have time to have dinner and do his homework at the same night before going to soccer or baseball practice from 6 to 7.30? When would we have time to spend with our families? We have very talented students in our development. To name a few, Tyler is a starting pitcher for the Weddington State Champion Baseball Team. Gabby and Drew are varsity soccer players. Ethan and Kevin play football. Aaron wrestles. Tiana swims. Haley's a cheerleader. I'm in the band. In addition, most of us belong to several clubs. Instead of driving 1.8 miles before and or after school, our parents will be burdened with the increased distance and the school being in the opposite direction from where most of them work. Mr. Pig. Can you explain how our smaller community will be redistricted while larger ones farther away from Wellington will not? Mr. Yurchek, you have not accepted the $3 million for the mobile classrooms, stating they are unsafe. Does this mean that you will be removing all mobile classrooms from all Union County schools, like the one at our high school and the multiple at Wellington Middle School? We have continuously heard that Sun Valley has structural issues. Mr. Stewart, why would you send more students to a school that is in need of repair? Over the last couple of months, the redistricting has been very stressful for us, our families, and our friends. We talk about it at the dinner table, in schools, and at activities. With the start of the new semester, one of the most common questions in class is, are you being redistricted? You have been teaching us a lesson in politics and have given us the understanding of how we should research and evaluate our choices and votes. We know that every election matters, every vote matters, our voices matter. I applaud the courageous women on the Board of Education, Mrs. Tajes and Mrs. Savage, for they are asking the hard questions and questioning the answers because I matter. They are truly speaking for me, for all of the kids. I beg the other board members to find it in their heart to stop the redistricting and do what's best for the students. Thank you. Good evening. 
My name is Astrid Falcone. I live in Collinwood, and my daughters attend Weddington schools. Having kids, many of you can probably relate to me. Oftentimes, when talking to our children, we might feel like we're talking to a wall. That's how I feel when communicating to the majority of the board members. Not open to alternatives as if your mind is already made up. It seems like we're wasting our time. But then, sometimes, our kids surprise us and follow our advice. And we know all that talking paid off. I'm praying that this is what will happen here with the members of the board. After hearing all of these passionate people speak against redistricting, I hope you hear something that will change your mind. I know that redistricting or shifting students around has often been the easy solution to overcrowding. It makes sense, however, if you're building a new school and need to fill it. But in this case, when only part of Antioch is moved to Sun Valley, and at the same time, Sun Valley kids are moved out, it doesn't make sense. And it definitely is not in the best interest of the children, especially when neither of the kids want to move. Too much is going on right now. And you, as the Board of Education, need to take a step back. First, focus only on the schools that are at capacity. Second, use the funds that are available to fix up the schools and find out why the scores in some clusters are lower and make improvements where necessary. Third, ask the talented parents both for and against redistricting for their input and help. Reflect on all these speakers that stood before you. Listen and act on what they, on what they were standing for. Above all, these are whom you should be representing. They know what is best for their kids. You possess so much power, too much in my opinion. Your decisions affect so many families, neighborhoods, and most importantly, our children. We all remember key events in their lives. Being forced away from their friends, sports, and their schools is one thing these students will remember for the rest of their lives. Board of Education, you are the ones making that decision. Please vote no to redistricting. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Falcone. I'm in sixth grade at Weddington Middle School. These are my sisters, Isabella, who is in fourth grade at Antioch, and Audrey, who is in second grade. She also goes to Antioch. We love our schools. I am on the Weddington Middle School swim team. We are so happy, and we all are straight-A students. My sisters and I have talked a lot about redistricting, and we have some questions. I am at I am Isabella and this is my question. We are moving from our school to another school and the kids from that school are also moving to another school. I don't understand that. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. We are all going to miss our friends and teachers. Also, all our friends that live in the neighborhood across the street don't have to move. They are also very sad because I might have to change schools. My name is Audrey, and this is my question. We heard our bus ride is going to be much longer. We already have to get up at 5:45. Now, to make it our to make it to our bus stop, if it's going to be longer, do I have to leave even earlier? I really like wedding to middle school. This is my first year of middle school. I have many friends here. A lot of my friends don't have to move. I have really good grades, and I'm on the swim team. Also, I'm really nervous and scared to go to a new school. Vote no tree districting.
My name is Marnie Setlis. My husband Mark and I, along with our five and a half year old son Eli, live in Chestnut Oaks, part of the Weddington Cluster. My eyes are closed and I can see. My eyes are open and I see. I see through my heart, my ears, touch, taste, and smell if I pay attention and allow myself to see. Are you allowing yourselves to see? I've never thought of myself as a girl with rose-colored glasses. I believed I saw objectively, well, for most people in situations. My belief wasn't wrong, but many times my objectivity was based on my own experience. Today I understand and see life differently. I hear and view others' opinions differently. Maybe some of it was taking my own frame of reference or ego out and being open to other points of view when my ego was screaming, that won't work, that isn't right, they don't know. This reminds me of the situation within our county. This county is in an emotional uproar to, due to the proposed school reassignment. We parents came together less than eight weeks ago, many of us strangers from all walks of life, different opinions, and living in neighboring communities. We rallied, we were united and positive. Over the weeks, we've worked together to research, uncover, discover, and formulate innovative ideas, visions to bring back to you, the Board of Education, in hopes of working together and creating a better long-term solution for the issues that prompted the reassignment. We haven't been met with open arms. It's a challenge to have a conversation with anyone when the persons don't answer questions or engage. Feeling unheard or invisible is an awful feeling for anyone. I look at the folks we elected to the Board of Ed. And like all people, you are good people. You ran for these positions in an effort to help our county and our children. And I applaud you for that. The challenge is remembering why you are there and the promises you made to get elected. Egos get involved, like not playing well with the county commission. And sometimes it's difficult to let that stuff go. Passion takes over and it becomes difficult to see from any viewpoint but where you are at that moment. I get it. I hope you will take a step back from your own experience. Allow yourselves to see other points of view. Be open to innovation. Dialogue with the stakeholders and create a long-term vision benefiting everyone in this county. Would you consider taking a step back and put yourself in our shoes? Would your choices then be different? Would you feel or see the situation differently? Can you take yourself out of it long enough to see objectively another point of view and truly be open to accepting one that isn't yours? It's not always easy. Some days I struggle with it, but wow, is it worth it when I take a step back. Please grandfather all students where they sit now or they're supposed to go next, or do the MCR solution as a temporary solution and use the time created to work with us to create a long-term vision together. Thank you. Kim Ormiston on behalf of Potter's Trace. Table this redistricting proposal. Keep all Union County kids in the schools that they love. Why are most of you so defensive of this plan instead of considering the other real viable options? What is it? You are not reflecting the character of UCPS as we've known it and instead have created one of disdain, unprofessionalism, and distress. And this is not who we want to be. You still have time, though, to change that perception, acknowledge that you hear us, and make the right choice for the pe people of Union County. Mr. Stewart, you and I share something in common. To the Board of County Commissioners, you have passionately defended what you think is right for our schools. You and I shared the podium at the November 18th meeting in agreement and demanded that they drop the appeal. At that same meeting, you also claimed that the education of our children is a team effort. So why now do you seem to be so dismissive of the parents' opinions as if they are not important in your decision making? You also claim that the county commissioners were trying to camouflage the mess they made. The way we see it, the same is happening here. You're a very vocal person, as am I. Be the one to step up since the facts don't add up and explain to us the real motive. This is not an overcrowding issue. There is no logic to uprooting 6,000 kids to make space for a couple hundred. You ended that speech to the county commissioners with do the right thing. We say the same to you tonight. Do the right thing and vote no to redistricting. Mr. Yurchek, you've stated that you're not used to the high citizen attendance at the Board of Ed meetings. Our presence should be sending a clear message that something is very wrong. Humble yourself and guide this board to see that this plan is not in the best interest of Union County families. 
understand that when a vote is taken to not accept the $3 million because it might upset the $91 million verdict, that this board is stating that it's all about the money before the kids. Know that when you don't question the proposal to move kids from higher performing schools to lower performing schools, instead of the other way around, you have put improving test scores above the kids. Your focus has been consumed by a lawsuit and redistricting that it seems other important school issues have fallen by the wayside. Work with the county commissioners. Do the right thing. Vote noted redistricting. Dr. Ellis, you came up to me during the break at the February meeting and said that you are not in favor of redistricting. Tell this board that. We, why are there so many unanswered questions about the alternatives? Why weren't spending priorities provided by you to the board where ADA compliance and leaking roofs were paramount to upfitting new stadiums? Why was Southern Providence hardwired two years after it had already been wireless? Why is Union County Public Schools claiming to not have funds, yet we've just learned that you've got th over $3 million in carryover federal funding, of which $1.7 million is in unallocated funds, according to DPI? Why weren't these funds spent on fixes or teachers? What's the correlation to all these questions? Well, these unanswered questions, along with many others, coupled with this drastic redistricting proposal, make us question if race to the top is the true motive since there are other less impactful ways to deal with gradual overcrowding. We ask that you stand up for us and recommend to th that this board turn it down. Stand behind your statements of we can do it, or where your proposals or other viable options such as MCRs presented just to pacify the public. Did you think that you can say you didn't have the money and that these options would simply disappear? The county commissioners have offered the money, so now what? We understand that you are not a voting member. But according to several board members, they are looking for direction, direction from the administration. Who is leading who here? Keep Union County from repeatedly redistricting and encourage this board to implement one of the other real options. Do the right thing. Ms. Helms, Mr. Pig, Mr. Guzman, Mr. Crowder, surely you have questions. We have all had a million questions. Why are you so silent? Where is this discussion taking place? It certainly hasn't been in front of the public. You haven't returned any of my emails, nor many of these other people's emails. To call the citizens affected by your proposed plan special interest groups and to hide behind that guise to not meet or speak with us is shameful. Your vote matters. You need to acknowledge that you hear us. Do the right thing and vote notary districting. Mr. Collins, it has been said that you don't believe there's a long-term plan to be had. Seriously? Union County Public Schools will be educating students for decades to come. No strategic planning committee meetings between February 1st of 2013 and 2014. Strategy is paramount to executing any proposal. How can you justify pushing through a proposal attached to no strategy? You must be willing to work with your stakeholders. It is obvious that the great majority of the people here don't want to be redistricted. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Don Helms, and I live in the Blackstone community. I have a son, Alex, who's a freshman at Weddington High School, and a daughter, Olivia, a fifth grader, at Wesley Chapel Elementary. So let me be clear from the start that I oppose redistricting. You've heard all the reasons from people much more eloquent than I. So what I want to do with my time tonight is to reframe your thinking just a little bit by, re by relating a personal experience and then issuing you a challenge. So if the name Helms doesn't make it obvious, I'm, uh, I'm from around here. Heard it said you can hardly throw a rock around here and not hit a helms with it. So my roots run deep here, and I'm proud to call this my home. But more than 30 years ago, I was subjected to a massive redistricting in Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. I can say without any hesitation that it was the worst experience of my young life. Agonizingly long bus rides, lost friendships, no sense of belonging or community or affiliation with my school and worse, outright fear because of the open hostility that existed between student groups. Thinking about this redistricting proposal in my own children, it dredged up those old feelings that I had, that disconnected feeling, that confusing experience during a very emotionally challenging time for any kid. We can do better than this for our children today. 
Others have presented viable, thoughtful alternatives that will impact thousands fewer students. It will protect the interests of taxpayers and definitely prioritize the rights of current Union County residents. There's no legitimate reason to push through this unprecedented and unnecessary plan right now. Instead, right now, each one of you has a unique opportunity and an incredibly important responsibility. Our schools and our entire community stand at a crossroads, and you have to choose the path. It's not an enviable choice that you have to make. But you can't correct the mistakes of the past. You can't replace poor planning of your predecessors or of other municipal boards. But right now, you can show our children true leadership and chart a new course for UCPS. Step away from the politics, the hidden agendas, and the infighting. Right now, you can do the right thing and put an end to the self-replicating cycle of redistricting that tears apart the very fabric of our community. And it solves nothing. Embrace the ideas and the collaboration of engaged citizens that you have here before you tonight and the united effort. We are Union County, after all. Real leaders will put aside the egos and perceived personal offenses to open their perspectives and take the time to make the right long-term de decisions for the best future of our students and our community. Right now, nothing is more important than that. So do the right thing and vote no on redistricting. I think it's obvious that we do not have a capacity issue. Why the sense of urgency? This is an isolated event in a small part of the county, and it makes no sense why you're doing this. I want to go over a few numbers. Maybe it'll shed some light. We have uh, Sun Valley High School. We have 393 students moving out, 27 subdivisions moving out and 407 moving in. That's a net gain of 14. Monroe High School, 112 students moving out, 303 new test scores moving in. This is a Title I school. What happens after the redistricting? 82% of those students are economically disadvantaged. Do you know this? Why are you moving 303 students into this school? Sun Valley Middle School, 341 moving out, 361 moving in. Net gain, 20. 361 test scores moving in. Cuthbertson losing 586 students, all to Parkwood except for three kids. That will leave them with 525 empty seats. What is going on? Piedmont High School losing 91, gaining 321 test scores. Parkwood not losing anyone, gaining 417 test scores. All of us must follow rules, regulations, and laws, and so do you. Why is it okay for you to ignore your own rules and policies? Union County Board of Education Policy Manual 4-13 states schools may operate above capacity through the use of MCRs. On March 26th last year, you had a unanimous vote to add MCRs to Wingate Elementary. We have hundreds of MCRs in use today. The government uses thousands of MCRs. The Board of Education is charged with providing our children with stability and continuity of education. You broke this policy when you decided to inform our children on exam week that they were going to bus 5,800 kids and change every middle and high school you could possibly put your hands on. Your plan stops all extracurricular activities for all students that are being bused. We are trading that in for bus rides on dangerous roads. 
We had another accident this morning at Wesley Chapel Elementary School intersection. Thank you. My name is Sandy Simpson. I live in Callenwood. I'd like to start off with a quote from my personal hero, Mr. Ronald Reagan. Governments tend not to solve problems, only rearrange them. We have heard numerous times from members of this board that unchecked growth in western part of Union County has led to some schools being over capacity. But according to your numbers, your own projections, only four schools will be over cap levels next year for a total of 284 students, projected students. Yet the proposed redistricting plan will re rearrange 5,800 students and does nothing to manage the growth in the western parts of the county. Time and time again, some members on this board said that the local municipalities of the county continue to issue permits for new homes, which further complicates your efforts to manage growth. At the February 18th Board of Education work session, Mr. Yurchek, you commented that as long as Marvin, Weddington, Waxhaw, Stallings, Indian Trail are going to hand out building permits without consulting us, without taking heed of what we tell them, without paying attention to what's going on. In fact, Mr. Yurchak, you said <laughs> developers are like crack to those people. I agree. Let's, take, let's look at the facts. Is Western County, Western part of Union County a high growth area? Absolutely. So how does redistricting plan work to alleviate that problem? It doesn't. It further complicates the problem. Under your proposed redistricting plan, this Board of Education will create an additional 2,487 classroom seats in Weddington, Cuthbertson, and Marvin and Porter Ridge clusters by rearranging 5,800 students if you vote yes to the current proposal. You will give the very towns you criticized 2,487 more reasons to issue these permits. Sir, just say no. Nancy Reagan. <sighs> The majority of the parents in this room behind me, I know them personally because I have volunteered in Weddington schools for the last eight years. Chose not to go back to work because I'm an invested member of my community. I am the vice president of the Weddington Miss, uh, Middle School PTSO. I have served with these people. I have worked my butt off. I even stayed in that school when I didn't have a child there. Currently, Susie Helms is our secretary. She's also on our board. Her child is not in the school this year. That's dedication and that's teamwork. We are vested because we are proud of our school. We don't ditch on, we don't diss on these other schools. We're not against any other schools. We're as proud as they are of our community. So I ask you, instead of working against us, let's start to get back. Let's work together. Let's do what's most important for the for the people who are all affected in this. You've seen them. There are children, and we ask that you stop rearranging the problem every two to three years. Let's solve it. Vote now. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Charles Horn. I live in the Blackstone subdivision, 302 Castlestone. I came here before you uh, to represent myself, but to ask you to please vote against, no against redistricting. I spoke with most of you, those who would return phone calls or emails. I have reached out to everyone on the board, and I once again ask you to look at the numbers, to look at the specific questions. MCRs has been a big conversation. There were options against redistricting proposed at multiple year meetings. And I'd like to say <clears throat> one of the things I believe I bring to the conversation is I'm a full-time paid firefighter for 15 years. We participate in active shooter scenarios, school drills, fire drills, and I find great concern in capping to say that there's a group of public safety officials out there that are telling you you can't put more students in a school and it's not safe. If the fire marshal does not want you to put more school students in a space, they take a sticker, they put it on the wall, and you cannot put more students in the space. It's not a question, it's not an option, it's not an appeal. That's not what's occurring. <clears throat> well, um, more of the housing bubble. In 2000, between 2005-2008, this county experienced one of the largest housing bubbles and growth 
in the history of this county, in the history of the state. And we were able to survive that growth without massive redistricting. Why is that? Because there was planning. There were options. There were stakeholders to the table. So now, after the housing bubble, with the worst building permit issuance in the last four years of the last 15, you want to tell us that 6,000 students need to move. That doesn't pass the smell test. We ask for transparency. Speaker after speaker after speaker have stepped before this board and issued you multiple questions, challenges, showed that they're invested in a solution. And there is conversation occurring, but it's got to occur where we can hear it. More has to take place on the stage. Currently, the county commission is beating you over the head with $3 million. We have stepped up the table and we are involved more publicly at these meetings. Obviously, we've been involved at schools. That's what you've heard. Eventually, you're going to get a chance to beat them over the head with the $81 million. I ask you to put it out there. What would an $81 or $91 million judgment, if they wrote you a check tomorrow, what would you fund? What would you do? Mirror any proposal to move students with a capital improvement plan. There is no plan. There is no long-term achievement. To say that we've moved students time and time again every few years is not a true statement. Conversations with Dr. Webb, conversations with a few of you that are there, we've had two redistricting that did not include opening a school. Thank you very much. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Ellis and Dr. Webb. My name is Jess McCastro and I live in the Brooks subdivision in Wesley Chapel. Contact 980-229-9678. On February the 3rd, I sent you a short PowerPoint that included objective perspectives and solutions on this important decision. Since then, you have heard compelling presentations that leave no doubt about the real and detrimental impact massive redistricting will have, and you have been provided overwhelming evidence that other solutions are better and avoid the negatives. But there's been no discussion about the positives. So let's get to the truth about your scripted reality TV show that you've been directing over the past six weeks. It is clear by your disregard for sensible solutions and intelligent questions, and often the demeaning manner you have shown to each other, parents and children, that something else is going on. Solving the overcrowding issue is really a clever distraction from your real objective. The only positive for massive redistricting is that the overall test performance of Sun Valley High School and Parkwood High School will improve significantly and immediately. This will in turn improve property values in those areas, resulting in opportunities for builders and UCPS gets two more improved high schools, but no decrease in the existing high-performing schools. What a brilliant move for those who benefit. Further evidence of this ploy is a series of maneuvers you've orchestrated. Direct and specific questions about why massive redistricting is being recommended have been blatantly ignored. Further, the origin of the proposal has never been disclosed nor was the reasoning for how the specific boundary lines were drawn. I suspect it came from the BOE and Dr. Webb was asked to support it. Dr. Ellis did not originally discuss the pros and cons and only when there was public outcry did she offer a concern. Direct questions about why the use of trailers is not being considered have been blatantly ignored. The only response to the three million offer from the BOCC was trailers are not an option. Then there was the unsupported notion of safety concerns. All the theatrics about not returning text is a convenient excuse to avoid the questions under the guise of the lawsuit. Lack of the most basic evaluation tool? Even a fifth grader knows how to chart out the pros and cons of the options and work together with a team to rate them. The main speakers in favor of massive redistricting have been Richard and Kevin. I suspect that a vote will be called as early as tomorrow in an effort to pass this before the truth comes out. It is possible that one or two of you 
are driving this ploy and have convinced enough of the others to be unwitting partners. To keep this a secret is subversive and irresponsible to all the stakeholders, especially the people you elected, who elected you to represent them and to perform your job with integrity. I suspect Kevin and Richard may be the instigators since their districts stand the gain the most. I suspect Rick, both Johns, Christina, Michael, and Dr. Ellis and Dr. Webb may be going along with it since they've been not been forthcoming about their questions or viewpoints. After all, the ploy can indeed be pulled off because of the politics, power, and influence that are so clearly being illuminated now. You were elected or appointed to address the needs of UCPS because you represented yourselves as competent and trustworthy leaders that would exhibit integrity and represent the people that elected you and put their trust in you. If massive redistricting passes, here's your legacy. Over 6,000 kids will be disrupted and dis disenfranchised, and their lifelong personal potential will be negatively affected. Over 20,000 students will lose tens of thousands of dollars in property value. And the worst, the truth about this ploy will come out. The county will be torn apart and torn down due to the resulting mistrust in the governing bodies. It will take years to repair the brand of Union County Public Schools and Union County. You can still decide to do the right thing. Below is your progress report. Integrity and leadership, F. Engagement and process, F. Solution effectiveness, F. I pray that your conscience will convict you to take the right action so that when your kids ask you if you did the right thing, you can give them an honest answer. Please bear with me as I am losing my voice. My name is Angela Bolin. I live in the Kellerman development in Stallings between Chestnut Lane and Potter's Road. Much like hundreds of the other parents you've already heard from, my husband and I relocated to Union County from out of state to start a family and chose our neighborhood solely based on the elementary school our future children would go to. We've been in our home for six and a half years and our oldest is now a soon to be kindergartner. Hence, all of this is my first taste of public schooling in the county. As you might imagine, I am less than excited to have to be here tonight. Rather than waste my three minutes on statistics or analysis, I opt to, I opt to discuss an eye-opening phone conversation I had this past Thursday afternoon with my district's representative, John Collins. I emailed him to ask his position on the redistrict as I hadn't heard much from him during the past three Board of Education meetings that I had attended. He then called and informed me that he, along with the majority of you, are already 100% for the redistrict. I wanted to crawl into a hole and cry. However, he went on to tell me that he first joined the board approximately 12 years ago after his own children had been redistricted three times. He hadn't foreseen a future in politics, but stepped up to the plate for the sake of those kids and had big plans to change the way things work. Unfortunately, though, by his own admittance, after such a long run in his position, he has come full circle. He told me that, given the continued growth of the county, the only long-term quote-unquote solution from his vantage point is redistricting every approximately five years. This approach, from my vantage point, is appalling and lazy, to be quite frank. In my humble opinion, there has to be a better long-term plan. Speaking about the solutions, John did mention that he reviewed the work of several smart and motivated Union County parents, such as Mike Kroll, author of The Kroll Dude Report had put together. John stated, no matter how intelligent, no one person is going to come up with a viable option in a mere three weeks. Now, with that point, I do agree. That brings me to my heartfelt plea here this evening. Since this room and moreover county is filled to the brim with both bright and resourceful parents, can you please give us more time? My proposal is that you allow us to create an advisory committee comprised of such parents. The potential redistrict is motivation for us to come together and construct an innovative, viable, and truly long-term solution. If you give us a deadline and we haven't come up with anything better than redistrict redistricting, then so be it. But I believe we will if and only if you give us the chance. I would be willing, much like John Collins was 12 years ago, to step up to the plate and chair said committee. I, as he did, want what is best for my kids. Thank you, Mr. Collins, for your candor, and thank you all for your consideration.
My name is Christy Gaines and I live in Providence Hills. Up until tonight, we're one of the smallest neighborhoods affected by this redistricting. We have 19 students affected, two high schoolers, nine middle schoolers, and eight elementary school children. We are a, a neighborhood divided by, by Mecklenburg County and Union County, so we don't go to school with our Butler neighbors. I've lived in my home for 18 years, and to be honest with you, I feel like the carpet has been pulled out from underneath me. We haven't had any new construction in our neighborhood in 12 years. We're all established residents. I want you to think back for a minute. School is hard. The homework, the hormones, the pimples, the breakups, the gossip, the mean girls that won't talk to you, the teacher who does, just doesn't get you, the honors courses you wish you'd never taken, the jocks who just don't know your name, someone took your seat at lunch, your best friend ignored you in homeroom, and you missed the bus. It's all exhausting. Today's students have it even harder. EOGs, EOCs, AIGs, PSATs, SATs, ACTs, AP, IB, and their GPA, all to worry about. It has really changed since we were there. How can they maintain their sanity? Don't screw up, kid. Try harder. Everything's riding on that class rank. We're training them for jobs that don't exist, systems that are collapsing, and yet we still expect them to solve world hunger and cure cancer, and now you tell them that they have to change schools and clusters? Our kids are already in pressure cookers, ready to explode. I referenced a psychological study that was pub published in January of 2014 from the Journal of the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychi Psychiatry, of which you were provided a copy last Thursday evening. The study looks at potential pathways linking school mobility to psychotic-like symptoms. The results? School mobility was significantly associated with definite psychiatric-like problems. Moves are not normative as a child progresses through school. School change is stressful for students. These students have lower self-esteem, feelings of inadequacy, they have feelings of social defeat. They are bullied, they have feelings of being excluded from the majority. They have sleep disturbances, they withdraw, they have irritability, they have drops in their grades. They have dramatic changes in their moods, they're weepy, they complain of headaches, stomach aches, and the list goes on. So, of the 5,849 students being redistricted, 228 of them will exhibit these symptoms. Let me repeat, 228 will exhibit these symptoms. The safe friends are also just as affected as well. In the Weddington cluster alone, 68 children will be affected. Where's the school psychologist, the school social worker, or the guidance counselor to help with these students? Let me answer that. They're filling out the paperwork to move these kids to another school. Redistricting isn't free. It comes with a cost. It costs our children. Woodrow Wilson once said, friendship is the only cement that will ever hold the world together. In honor of Hope Stout Day, which is tomorrow, March 4th, she was a Weddington Middle Schooler, if you remember. In honor of her, she would do the right thing, and I ask you to do the right thing. Do what Hope would have done. Vote no for redistricting. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katarina Biancardi, and I live at 2418 Providence Hills Drive. And I'm going to share some light with you with the help of Robert Frost. The road not taken. Two roads diverge into a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted to wear, though, for the passing there, had warned them really about the same. In that morning, both equally lay, and leaves no step had trod of black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverge into a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by because that has made all the difference. The point of this poem, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Webb, and members of the Board of Education, this is your opportunity to be historic. Union County has been on this constant roller coaster for the past 20 years. When evaluating this current redistricting plan, it's been used over and over. And it's certainly easy. It's easy to move students. It's easy to redraw lines. But the thing is, 
when you are elected members of education, what needs to be implemented is a plan that is a long-term solution that positively benefits families, communities, and teachers. Obviously, it's more challenging, but the role of the leader is not to take the easy way out, but to find the best solution to have a vision. It's intelligent to take time. It's intelligent to research other options, such as the $3 million mobile classroom units that have been offered, but also to re construct overcapacity schools and have brand new neighborhood developments be assigned to the newer schools. A leader is proactive, not reactive. This should not be a hastily made decision that impacts over 5,000 students' lives plus their families, friends, and neighborhoods. I believe it is a true gift to act upon Robert Frost's simple words. Though, this is your chance to get off the path Union County has been traveling down for so long. Therefore, take the road less traveled by because it will make all the difference. Here, I provide for you each a copy of Robert Frost's poem. This will remind you to do the right thing and say no to redistricting. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Lance Simpson, and I live in the Callenwood neighborhood. This board continues to speak out on the lack of funding provided to Union County schools. However, if the current redistricting plan is approved by Union County, the schools will be paying higher transportation costs that will not be covered by the state. Under the proposed redistricting plan, Union County school buses will travel an additional 275,000 miles per year. I know, you've heard it before. This is based on one bus per neighborhood per school using your own methodology. According to Derek Graham from the Department of Public Instruction, Union County Schools will absorb 100% of these costs for the first year. That's $1.5 million that Union County Schools will have to pay in the 2014-2015 school year. Union County Public Schools may be eligible for up to $800,000 of additional funds in the second year, which still leaves a shortfall of $700,000 or more in that year and subsequent years. In addition to the $1.5 million expense, could place Union County schools in a position where local transportation expenditures are capped. This would mean taxpayers of Union County would be paying even more for this free redistricting plan. Will Union County Public Schools go back to the Board of County Commissioners and ask them to pay for these additional costs? If not, what building repairs or school programs will be cut? Are you going to cut safety, security, instruction, maintenance? How are you going to offset the additional $1.5 million? There's other information floating around that's related to redistricting, and I'm asking the board to either confirm or deny the accuracy of this information. And I'm also requesting the Board of Education to provide all documentation and communication related to the response to these questions. Race to the top has been mentioned numerous times as a reason to report redistricting. Let's put this to bed once and for all. Over the last two years, Union County Public Schools has received $9 million in funds for Title I, II, and III schools. Of this $9 million, $3.4 million is part of the carryover funds left from the prior year. 1.7 million of that 9 million still remains unallocated. If true, why hasn't Union County Public Schools spent these funds on teachers and instruction? Or to relieve overcrowding, building repairs? With a need for funds in Union County Public Schools, why is the money left unspent? I'm sure faculty and staff could find a use for it. Or is it being saved for the hidden plan? Is it true that according to the Department of Public Instruction, Union County Public Schools has one of the largest carryover of federal and state funds in the state. And as a result of these carryovers, the Department of Public Instruction is approving a smaller number of Union County Public School grants. Fewer grants mean more taxpayer money that's going to have to go to Union County Public Schools. And is it true that a large portion of the race to the top funds have been spent on technology and infrastructure and not teaching and instruction? As mentioned earlier, you spent a large amount of money to hardwire South Providence when that school was already wireless. That was a waste of money that you, according to you, so desperately need. So why the rush to redistrict? Can you state unequivocally Thank that the redistricting you, has nothing to do with race to the top funds? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Ellis. Uh, my name is Scott Smith. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to speak tonight. I am the uh, father of two children in the Weddington School District. My son, Drake, is a freshman at Weddington High School where he excels in academics. 
and athletics, my daughter Kendall is a little spitfire that you may recall as being speaker number 33, who's a seventh grader at Weddington Middle School, and I couldn't be more proud of her for her emotional uh, tribute tonight to uh, voting no against redistricting. Over the years, I've had volunteered hundreds of hours as a coach for Weddington Middle School uh, as a baseball coach and also as a football trainer and uh, equipment manager. In the process, I've met a number of people from many of our county schools, and I've developed a very healthy respect for those whom we call opponents across all school-related activities. The sense of family and school pride that comes from those who adorn their spirit wear, proclaiming their school loyalty, is quite impressive and should not be summarily disregarded. I truly fear what the proposed redistricting plan may do to our sense of school pride and community service and how it will impact those who regularly volunteer their generous and valuable time to our schools will be negatively impacted. I've observed the rallies, I've listened to the speeches, and I've become more closely so associated with this team, compromised or comprised of people from all schools bonded into one team to stand for something we all believe in. Please note we are not the barbarians at the gates. Our collective intelligence should not be disregarded or ignored by our elected officials as our group's research and investigation has produced powerful, accurate, and factual data. The adults tonight were fantastic. Every young lady and young boy that came up here and spoke to me stole the show, and that's what you should be listening to more. If overcrowding is truly the primary issue for redistricting, and the solution is not a difficult one to solve in the short term as we search for long-term plans. As we know, the county commissioners, a group of elected officials, which will also incur a very comprehensive voter vetting process in future elections, have offered $3 million for trailers to ease the burden of overcrowding. We understand there are no strings attached. We understand with the cost burden removed, safety is not an issue based on the number of trailers already scattered throughout the campuses throughout Union County. As a result, we respectfully ask that political agendas be cast aside and that these monies be accepted by the Board of Education. Some say redistricting is merely a guise to incorporate redistribution of wealth to artificially enhance testing results. I think the board members, I thank the board members for their commitment as elected officials. I estimate that none of you signed up for this. <clears throat> when you decide to run for public office. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Um, my name is Mark Bowie. I represent the Bowie family. And uh, when we came to Union County a few years ago, we had a one-year-old that we were looking to provide the best educational opportunity to. So, of course, we uh, looked at the school choices and chose our home around scores and testing results. My wife and I were very proud to be able to afford a home that could allow my son to go to school at Wesley Chapel Elementary and then Weddington and Weddington. Let's face it. People choose their homes based on the school district that are associated with the location of that home. I asked the school board to stop being a victim of growth. Stop complaining about growth and start taking action to drive the growth in the areas that you want to grow. Don't continue to complain about, well, we can't afford this, we can't do this, we can't fix this. Get by the politics with the county commissioners. Work together to build a stronger union county. I sit in the back over the last three and a half hours, and uh, you know I'm, I'm looking around the room, and there's a leaky roof in the back of this room here. The ceiling tiles are discolored. The, the air handler's making a racket because it hasn't been maintained. Spend money to fix these old schools. Find the money. Fix the schools and it'll drive growth in that area. So I ask the board, please work hard to retain school home choice so that people can live the dream of the home they selected 
and watch their children grow and develop inside those communities. I also ask the school board to work with the county commissioners instead of working against them or, find, or assigning blame on who did what, when, where, how. Sit down, let's figure it out. That's how great things are done, not by casting blame and being a victim. And finally, I say work on the schools that really you want to drive the growth in. I know I've pointed out some things here today, but it makes no sense. It makes no sense to drive children out of schools that are new, that are well appointed, into the older schools that don't have the ability to meet that, those needs. Doesn't make any sense. And I don't think anyone here tonight, barring a few, agree with that. Finally, I ask for three points. Stop reacting, start acting. Secondly, work together with the county. And finally, vote no and redistrict it. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Cindy Legrand. I live in the Wesley Chase subdivision in Wesley Chapel. My family and I do not support the proposed reassignment plan. As parents, we did our research before making a huge financial investment in a home in the school cluster we determined would best fit the, fit the needs of our children. Upon expressing my concerns over the negative educational impacts of this plan, several of you dismissed me, citing all schools across the state teach to the same set of standards. However, even the state of North Carolina recognizes and annually publishes reports that highlight the differences among these schools. While we have schools among the top 10 in the state, we also have schools that fall way short of the top 100. While we have schools that are, excuse me, while we have schools that essentially no crime or violence for others, the story is much different. While we have many schools in which 80% of more of the students demonstrate at or above grade level proficiency, we have other schools at which less than 50% do so. While some of our schools receive the Honor School of Excellence designation, others did not come close. From my perspective, my concerns are valid. The Facilities Committee was charged with a daunting task and directed to use available seats if possible, but when seats were not available or needed, their plan conveniently created them. I have two children at Weddington Middle School in 7th and 8th grades. My 8th grader is 6 foot 3 and 170 pounds. And when he goes to school each and every day and takes his seat in class, it is obvious his seat is occupied, every square inch of it. <laughs> and although my 7th grader is not nearly as big, his seat is no less occupied. Their seats are not available for this plan. But under this reassignment plan, the very seats they sit in will be pulled right out from under them. They will then be kicked out the door of our neighborhood school, only 1.8 miles from home and they will be placed in the third closest middle and high schools where they will take the seats that became conveniently available when students at those schools received the same treatment. Wesley Chase Subdivision and several others nearby are within two miles of our current Weddington schools, but we will be reassigned to Sun Valley Schools, the third closest middle and high schools. Yet several subdivisions within our current cluster are much farther away from Weddington schools than we are, and in some cases even closer to Sun Valley Schools than Weddington, Weddington schools but somehow they remain in the Weddington cluster. Any plan that proposes to shuffle 5,800 students, many to the second, third, fourth, and fifth closest schools to their homes, cannot be called efficient. Regardless of their motives, the Board of County Commissioners have, has presented you with an offer. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion that we counter that offer and ask that for one that allows the $3 million to be used for any viable option to halt this process. And then I motion that we utilize these funds to address immediate crowding issues for the upcoming school year stop all redistricting discussions, and then work together as leaders to develop a long-term plan that addresses deficiencies and accommodates growth within our school system. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Carolyn Blondin. I live in the Brooks neighborhood in Wesley Chapel, currently in the Weddington Cluster. Many of you have received numerous emails and telephone calls from me over the past several months asking you to meet with the Statistics Committee to go over the Kroll Dude Report. And only two of you have actually met with us, two out of nine of you, plus Dr. Ellis and Dr. Webb. We have, I'll get back to that in a minute though, let me skip that. 
Briefly, just real quick, my daughter graduated from Weddington High School in 2010. My son is a rising freshman at Weddington High School. He attended Weddington Elementary School when it was at 200% capacity. How did we get through that? I'll tell you how. We had a fantastic principal, Roseanne Bateman. We had fantastic, we had fantastic teachers, and we had a parent community that was extremely involved in that school. And we survived. We made it through. It wasn't ideal, and that shouldn't be a long-term fix. But mobile classrooms can work for overcrowding issues for a temporary relief. So give us the time to move forward with the long-term proposal that will get us through the next few years by using the mobile classroom. So let me get back to the Curl Dude report. There, were, there are hundreds of hours of research done by many, many, many talented people in this community. Um, we, um, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, but only, again, two of you have met with us. Two out of 11 of you. So since we haven't met with you, and we really don't know you, I would like to ask you each a few questions based on your bios that you have on the Board of Education website, because I don't know anything else about you. So I'm going to start with Sherry Hodges. Sherry, you were one of the two, so thank you. That's all I have to say. We know you, and we appreciate you. Mr. Collins, your bio stated that you were, you've been constantly asked your advice about school issues since your past history was in the school systems. So I ask you, and I want you to really think about this, why are you not talking to us? Why are you not listening to your constituents? We want your advice, but you're not letting us work with you. Ms. Helms, you stated that you um, want to help teachers be supported so they can provide the best possible education to our students. Have you thought about the teachers in the Title I schools who already have their hands full with underprivileged kids where they are the parents in some situations, the, the, the parental influence that they have, and now they're going to have more kids in their classroom so they can't provide that? Mr. Stewart, I really don't even know what to say to you. I, I just don't. I've heard so many horrible things and bad things about you, but I've yet to talk to you because you won't return my phone calls or my emails. Mr. Yurchek, you got my email today. You responded to it. Thank you. But I ask you, too, you want a positive impact on our schools and community? Is this a positive impact? I want to relinquish my spot to a student sitting in the airs. Um, my name is Sydney Ayers, S-Y-D-N-E-Y-A-Y-E-R-S. It's not about the number of kids in a school or a class, but about the kids worrying that they will, won't see their friends anymore because of the redistricting. I'm tired of not being heard. I feel that... I feel that you only think of the number, but my education is in your hands, and that is what keeps me up at night. As if we were not the reason that this is happening. Well, we are. And you do not see what's behind the scenes. Hundreds of kids, teenagers are crying, fighting, fighting with friends and worrying. I could give you millions of reasons why we shouldn't redistrict, but I only have three minutes. Think about all those kids you're making worry. Put your feet in their shoes. Isn't our county motto preparing all students for success? How can we follow through with our motto when we are moving students around school to school? They know, away from friends and teachers who are familiar and dividing our neighborhoods. It starts from the top. We need to care as much about us as we care about each other. Please take the money for the mobile classrooms or come up with ideas. We will leave, we leave as our current schools. My parents 
purposely moved to Union County so they wouldn't have to keep moving us around? Who wouldn't take three million dollars right in front of them? I have learning support and it's uncomfortable for me to know that I have to leave my class and everything I know well and that it just worries me that I know that I may have to leave a school that I know well and teachers that I'm familiar with. Mike Kroll, 1020 Aurora Vista Lane, Wesley Chapel. Thank you for allowing me three minutes to speak and get these three points off my chest. Point one, audience, for your information, the members of the facility committee are Chairman Yurchek, Mr. Collins, Mr. Pig, and Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, as the chairman of the facilities committee, we're looking forward to your meeting tomorrow. You indicated at the last BOE meeting that you would present your plan tomorrow night. Like you, I believe we should present to the county commissioners a comprehensive long-term plan. When we go asking for money without a plan, we have zero credibility. Second point, although I'm a resident of Wellington Cluster, I will now speak for the voices of the students of the Monroe Cluster. As I've studied the North Carolina report card data for the 2012-13 school year, it is evident that the students with limited English proficiency score poorly on the test. Based on the report card data, the three lowest performing elementary schools out of the total of 29 elementary schools are all within the Monroe Cluster. These three schools have 30% of students with limited English proficiency, 30% compared to the county average of 5%. At these three schools, only 20% of students are proficient on all tests taken, 2 in 10 proficient on all tests taken, when 3 in 10 have limited English proficiency. These three elementary schools feed into Monroe Middle School, which is the lowest performing middle school of our nine middle schools. At Monroe Middle School, 20% of students have limited English proficiency, and only 30% are proficient on all tests taken. Monroe Middle School feeds into Monroe High School. Monroe High School is the lowest performing of the nine high schools in Union County. Monroe High School has 20% of students that have limited English proficiency, and 20% that are proficient on all tests taken. One in five with limited English proficiency, one in five proficient on all tests. This pattern of students with limited English proficiency scoring lowest on the test repeats itself for the next three lowest scoring elementary schools, the next lowest middle school, and the next lowest high school. All of these are from the Forest Hills Cluster. Neither Forest Hills nor Monroe Cluster have exercised their voices in these hearings. I will gladly be their voice. Based on the percentages of limited English proficiency at these schools in Monroe and Forest Hills, this represents 1,414 students. According to the report card data, mostly black and Hispanic. While not all of these speak a language other than English, that is certainly a significant number in these nearly 1,500 students. UCPS has 17 English as secondary language or ESL teachers to serve these 12 schools in two clusters. This is one ESL teacher for every 83 students with limited English proficiency. The BOE's 2011-14 strategic plan identifies strategic priority of high achieving and globally competitive students. Mr. Stewart, again, I agree with you on focusing much less attention on the globalization agenda. How can we have students that can compete globally when in Union County, North Carolina, United States of America, we can't even make them proficient in English so they can be proficient on test? By failing to teach these kids to be proficient in English, we are sentencing them to a lifetime of minimum wage, a lifetime of government dependence, and unfortunately for some, a lifetime in jail. Where are the conversations to solve this real crisis, not the phony one? Good evening. My name is Katherine Condon, and my family lives in Wesley Chapel. I've worked in education both in the classroom and in administration for more than 20 years. I do believe that every school in Union County has some excellent teachers, administration, and students, but all schools are not equal. My husband and I chose the Weddington Cluster as the best for our children. 
I stand firmly united with my friends here across the county against redistricting and will not reiterate their sentiments, nor will I repeat the facts that prove this plan creates more problems than it solves. Instead, let's do a math problem in the spirit of the Common Core curriculum. A high school in Union County has an estimated enrollment of 1,422 students, a watch level of 1,560 students, and a cap level of 1,660 students. However, inexplicably, it did provide safe and quality education for 1,800 1, students at one time. 393 students will be moved out, and 407 students will be moved in under a massive countywide redistricting plan. Write an, write an equation to show how actual capacity can be determined. <clears throat> how many lunch shifts will be required in the cafeteria that is too small? How long will it be before redistricting is required again? Determine how many students will be negatively affected by this plan. Please explain each answer. Did anyone get that? Do you have enough information? This kind of complex, multi-step problem sends some kids into a panic. They immediately become frustrated and paralyzed with no idea where to start. A wall goes up and becomes impenetrable to reason or explanation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have hit that wall. And we have continued to batter our heads against that wall for two months now. I ask you now to do what we all should do when frustration takes over and the wall goes up. Stop. Take a step back. Breathe. Ask questions. Find other examples. Collaborate with others. Look at the problem again and work through it. Ask yourself, as an independent thinker, does this make sense? Our students do this on a daily basis. And quite obviously, we've done some of this homework for you. Appropriate solutions can never be reached when the wall is up and the mind is made up and closed. There are so many options available to you. Please look again with an open mind. Please ask yourself individually, have I shown my work? And does this make sense? We, your stakeholders, tell you that it does not. Thank you. Good evening. The essence of the question about an additional 270,000 miles is uh, based on a flawed inquiry, which is based on several flawed assumptions. Uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with the section chief, Derek Graham, and his understanding was not complete. Uh, I did give him some context. Essentially, with that number, 
has materialized is from the Crow Dude report, which, as has been shared, used some of the information from our projections. Those projections about grandfathering students, be it fifth grade, eighth grade, they were treated in isolation. So that's where the main, the primary flaw exists. That assumption takes into account that if we redistrict and treat those 5,800 students in isolation, we would create 270,000 additional miles. But those students represent roughly 22% of our ridership. They would not be taken out. They'd be included in our total ridership as a part of the redistricting process. This is something that the Transportation Division engages in every single year. That is a process that typically starts at the end of April or the beginning that first week of May. And it goes on until roughly two weeks before the students return. It's an incredibly labor intensive process. And it demands every bit of manpower and expertise that we have. The total ridership for Union County is roughly 26,000 students. If this board makes a decision on re re redrawing the boundary lines, we will take into account, if tasked by the board and by our superintendent, we will take our ridership in its totality. Engage in that process, that means redraw the maps in Edulog, which is the software system mandated by the state, and then engage in refining and revisions to those routes while also adding students throughout the summer. So that's the primary flaw with what you're hearing about an additional 270,000 miles. When, when I spoke with Mr. Graham and explained and gave him the context that that was never promoted by our division, that never came from internal process or internal professionals, he then understood that when we share that in confidence, we can absorb the changes to redistricting because we anticipate no dramatic increases to our ridership. We anticipate no exorbitant needs as it relates to equipment. So that is why this is such a flawed assumption. And, and this is why the information that people have received from Derek Graham was flawed. He gave a, 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 what I feel was a good faith response to a flawed question. However, during our conversations, as I shared, he was afforded that context and now understands where we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do I have any other in 
October of 2012, my years are running together, it was a 12, for a Race to the Top grant. That money was to provide master's degrees for teachers. That money was to provide technology for students. Um, and we were not successful in that grant. We have not reapplied for any Race to the Top grant. Or not one that I've asked senior staff is any of your department or any are any of your departments contemplating. I've not heard anybody say yes. As a matter of fact, people look at me and said, well, no ma'am, that was very labor intensive. Um, we are not looking at another race to the top grant. Someone suggested that we put in writing that we would not for five years. I can't tell you that Union County won't in three years apply for race to the top money, but I can say with clear heart and clear conscience. We have no, we have not even considered, we're looking at grants for master's degrees for teachers, I'll be very honest with you. Looking at businesses, I'm looking at um, companies, have not applied, and we're searching for grants that would give teachers master's degrees. But at no point in time have we looked at a race to the top grant for that. And race to the top money, um, every school district took it, the state of North Carolina, as a matter of fact, Union County was the one out of 115 that was not interested in taking it. The board was not. And um, I believe I remember um, I was not privy to the call because I was not superintendent, but the state superintendent calling the then superintendent saying that um, you're going to have to do most of the work even if you don't take the money. And I felt like, and I was not was not the decision maker at the time, but I felt like that money for teachers and infrastructure would be put to good use, and I believe it was. So there is no truth to we're looking at the race to the top grant right now at all. Uh, one last thing that um, I spoke to a gentleman Friday, and I've actually read this, the question to your staff, is can you, in the staff, and I'm sure you have the provide information um, if the judgment does how many times do you see how the funds will be spent specifically for use, upgrade ADA, upgrade, etc. from, and I, I guess I would be the facilities committee as well. You're talking about the court for $91 million. Yes, ma'am. Um, now, Michelle, don't let me say anything wrong here. Um, of the $91 million, $86 million and some change was for capital needs, and those were needs that were identified beginning in 2009 in the Comprehensive Facilities Study that were honed into the Comprehensive Facilities Plan. That money, every penny of that $86 million, is earmarked for needs that were identified. Right. And what someone was asking me for was specifically which schools were going to get X funds. The facilities may be working on that. Sorry, Michelle, I didn't hear you. Uh, what Ms. Moore said is the Facilities Committee is working on that right now. You're very welcome. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that I appreciate the time you've taken to come here tonight and the work you're doing. I do want to let you know also that uh, I hear you through your emails and through your phone calls. Through the personal meetings we have, I, I, I Get that the perception is you don't hear from us, and there's a lot of emails we get and a lot of phone calls. So it's 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 literally impossible to, to talk to everybody, but I do make the effort to talk to as many as I can during the day, and I'm sure there are people here that I talk to and send email back to. So I just want to let you know that obviously you're being you're being heard, and your ideas and suggestions are being considered. They, um, after every meeting, I have notes here. I get with the staff and other board members, and we ask questions about what about this idea, what about someone so said, this is possible. So it's not as if it's all falling on deaf ears. We're, we're taking it in, and we're looking at it. We can't look at it necessarily right here at the time, because I don't work that way. I have to take it down, figure out how many of you can approach the uh, staff with a question. And, Answer it's something we can do and we'll bring forward. I do also want to talk about the, the uh, meetings we've had, the uh, work sessions, and there's always been a lot of 
confusion, I think, regarding the time when uh, staff book and options plus two and row and different uh, viable options. And, and to me, I, I would want staff to bring us the options and whether or not they're options that we want to go forward with or consider, that's really up to the board to figure out. Is that a good option? It's, it's an option, and I don't want staff to eliminate every option. I think that's part of the board's job is to figure out is that an option we want to move forward with. So when it comes to mobile classrooms, is it an option? Yeah, that's an option. Is it an option we want to move forward? I think that's something we need to look at. We need to decide. The intention, as Dr. Ellis has stated, has always been to utilize the available resources for the seats in the fiscal response. And to me, taking $3 million and going out and buying mobile classrooms doesn't exercise the fiscal responsibility that I would want to support for a good time to have other schools that need upgrades, schools that have been waiting their turn to have things done to them, uh, and we're going to get them first. So the manual one, the million, the first one, we go get first. I know a lot of folks have been wondering you know, what, what I've been thinking about that, so and Mr. Chairman, just a quick comment. As far as Mr. Homer's comment earlier about the uh, public safety officials we deal with, uh, some folks say the fire marshal has said it's a problem. Uh, I've yet to see any documentation that's contrary to what we've met with these folks and heard in person. If somebody wants to produce that, I'd certainly be good to look at it. As far as the lack of repairs going on at county schools, uh, directly to the facility's website. We have group projects under design. We have some pair projects under design. With the money that we've uh, left from the county commission thus far, we are moving forward. As far as construction, we will be talking about that tomorrow night. We do have long-range plans. Uh, the perception that we've set around not doing anything, not having vision, is mistaken. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we're going to try to provide some insight for that tomorrow night. I've heard other speakers talking about where they take students for jobs that don't exist. We've got a lot of academies that we're partnered with high tech level industry, manufacturing academies, public safety academies, nursing academies, uh, regular trades, that sort of thing. So uh, that perception is the state, and I take exception to it. I think uh, Dr. Ellis and her staff have put it really hard to uh, serve all our students, and my size fits me. So, uh, I just wanted to speak to that because that's the same perception, and uh, that's all I have to share. Thank you. So, um, yes, I, I just wanted to take a minute to respond to a couple of things. Um, somebody said just a few minutes ago that you probably did not sign up for this. Well, I would like to say that I did. In 2010, um, I attended a meeting at the Lawson Clubhouse that was a at that time, it was a candidate forum. And one of the things that I said in that meeting to the public that attended was that it is very important for you to know where your elected official stands on the reassignment as it is related to the school system. Because in any area where there is high growth, that is absolutely something that you have to consider that that candidate is going to face, especially when you serve a four-year term. I wasn't sure that it was going to fall in the four years of my term, but I said at that meeting at that time that I first and foremost support favorite schools. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why, and I'm not sure if this gentleman is still there here either, but I was that child that was reassigned in a neighboring school. And not only was I reassigned past four schools, to a school that I couldn't even get to today, um, I had an hour and a half bus ride one way. So uh, my family saw other options, and when I re-entered public school, my neighbor, who was my best friend, went to was assigned to a different school right across the street from me in my same neighborhood. So I lived it, and I get it. And I've committed to asking questions. And I think that 
I appreciate the fact that everybody's here because I don't know that my parents had the opportunity to come to a public hearing and express their feelings. So I, I honestly um, want to say for the people that came out Thursday and the people that came out tonight, thank you so much for being involved and for being part of the process that questions something that does impact so many children in this county. Um, and I don't, I don't have any specific questions to ask right now because I would like to be reflective of the notes that I have taken. So the only thing that, that I guess we, we could possibly answer is the prevailing thing that comes up and up over and over in this process, and that is the explanation for the change in the watch and path levels in certain schools. <laughs> well, there, there have been several people that have asked, stating that they feel the numbers have changed between the watch and pass numbers at different schools. I didn't bring the schools in front of me, but that is, I, I took notice that that was a comment that was made several times. So. I'm not, uh, if, if that's something that we can discuss tomorrow, because I know we're going to be continuing the discussion tomorrow. Um, and then any other questions that we can get with staff, because as I said, I've taken a lot of notes and I, off the top of my head, can't compile. There may be something that I can just compile and summarize. We'll, uh, we'll shuffle the music tomorrow and make sure we add them for Thank you. 